Welcome everybody to the talk vaginal steaming in birth work. We're going to be talking about steaming in postpartum labor, fertility, and for pregnancy loss. We have um, the esteemed panelists today, some of my favorite people, Naima Bonds, a doula. We have midwife Piper, midwife Raquel, and we have Chantal, who herself has used steaming um, in labor and postpartum, and we'll be sharing her experience today. I'm so excited to talk to you all. We are going to be talking about all things steaming in birth work. Um, today, our, um, our talk is brought to us by a sponsor, um, the Build Your Nest Postpartum Workbook by Keistro oh, Zee. She is a cute. mama and um, a mother of two and a homeschooler in Oregon. She created this book be in order to help um, people when they're pregnant plan out their postpartum so that they have the rest, support, and care that they need. It goes through everything. It is such an incredible resource. And I'm so excited that she sponsored our talk today. So um, you can always go to um, buildyournest.com um, to find this workbook and find more information. And I'll also be sending that out with the talk afterwards. Okay, so let's start this panel and let's get to know the panelists a little bit better. My first question is what is your experience um, as a birth worker or a birth giver um, how long have you been doing it how many births have you attended and in what role okay so that's well, just jump in you guys whatever part of that you want to answer and we'll go ahead and start with Naima hello everyone my name is Naima Bond I am in the Atlanta metro and surrounding county area if you live in Atlanta you know takes us forever to get places but I have been a birth worker since 2015. Um, I am on my 42nd birth with about six or seven between September and January. And what was the last question, sis? <laughs> um, what role? Oh, you're oh, a doula, a birth doula, supporting births, supporting people birthing. All right, very good. Chantal, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so I'm definitely a birther. I'm a mother of three. And um, I don't consider myself a birth worker, but more so a supporter of women who are either trying to conceive, preparing for their birth, or recovering afterwards, or recovering mm -hmm. after pregnancy loss as well. And you said three children? Yes. And... STEAM practitioner? Yes, of course. I didn't mention that. <laughs> so I certified with the Perry Steam Hydrotherapy Institute in 2019. I'm a Perry Steam hydrotherapist in training. Um, it's an honor to be here with some of my teachers. And um, yeah, I serve women virtually now um, through consultations and um, yeah, courses to help women prepare for you know their postpartum or just overall uh, preconception support wonderful thanks chantal okay raquel i'm gonna go to you next hi y'all bilali i'm raquel Coatzilali, and i am a midwife here in los angeles um and i've been a midwife for seven years i've been a birth worker since 2012 so however many years that is um, I'm a full spectrum midwife, so I work with the uterus in all its phases and stages of birth, preconception, pregnancy loss. Um, and I've, I don't know how many births I've been to at this point. I should probably start trying to keep track, but I imagine it's maybe been in the like 500s or so. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh steam steam your experience oh yeah i'm a peri steam hydrotherapist as well <laughs> awesome. and guest teacher for steamy chick institute <laughs> this is the anatomy teacher <laughs> the anatomy instructor i could never even approach the topic like raquel so i just had her come on <laughs> yes and kimberly just reminded me that or like i was the midwife who was in the streets doing the vet the fourth trimester vaginal steam study 
That was the next one. Yeah. Yes. So in, um, for those that don't know, um, about four years ago, um, we crowdfunded in order to be able to do a trial study to look at uh, people who steamed after giving birth versus people who didn't steam after giving birth. And we wanted to have one point researcher who could do actually um, vaginal exams and, and take all of the stats. And that was Raquel. So she got to see the group of, of, of moms who, who gave who gave birth and who did the steam, who steamed and then who did it. And she we were able to compare um, the results. And we also have um, Kimberly Johnson here and um, Jale um, as participants watching on who were involved in that study. So a really incredible study um, where we were able to grab statistics, you know, actual statistics and get, you know, the experience of a midwife looking at the difference between these two groups. It was pretty fascinating. Um, all right, and then so lastly, um, Piper, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Piper. I am a mother and midwife and STEAM fan. Um, I've birthed seven times at home and I've used STEAM in my most recent several births for postpartum recovery. It has been a wonderful, relaxing tool. Um, I've been doing birth work for about 15 years and numbering in the hundreds as well, from friend to doula to midwife. Um, and I feel very honored to have served in many different homes and um, environments and seen STEAM utilized in lots of different settings, which has been really um, interesting to watch the, the wisdom sort of begin to re-proliferate through the community. Um, and I think that's all the questions. And just so you guys know, Piper actually supported me during my birth. So yeah, super sweet. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about steaming. So I want to ask you guys, um, how did you start using steaming um, personally and in your work? Um, and then what current situations do you recommend steam uh, to others and why? So Naima, we'll go ahead and start with you again. Sorry, me personally, so I had an issue and that's how I got introduced to steaming. I was a birth doula, I had no idea how to connect the two, but I had just very heavy, heavy cycles and didn't know what to do. So I contacted the Steam Institute and I feel horrible because your cousin who was in Atlanta at the time, Jale, am I saying her name? Mm -hmm. I got connected with her and you know, at first, I'll be honest, I was skeptical. My friend brought it up. I was like, uh, how's Steam going to fix that? And then I messed up my clothes at work and could not leave till seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I said, who, who, now what is that about Steam again? What? Because, <laughs> I, you know, and so um, long story short, she recommended some herbs and it took about five months, but I knew something had changed because my cycles had changed. And then when I'm back to my doctor, she thought the machine had broken because she didn't see, I had developed two sm small fibroids and they were gone. So that is literally what made me decide, like, I need to understand this. I think I started just emailing you, Kelly, like, this is so great. And um, got super duper excited. And then being a birth worker, you later added on the courses of steaming and labor, steaming and postpartum. And I got interested and was able to take those classes as well. And then I slowly started to introduce it into my practice. Yeah, I remember that was so sweet. You were like, wait, we can use this? Like, we can use this for birth? You were like, oh my gosh. You know, because you were already like, okay, as a doula, you know, one cool thing I think about doulas is you all talk to every, people talk to you guys about, yes, birth, but then, you know, when somebody has a period problem, they come to do this. So I think it's really incredible when doulas know about steaming, right? But then you were like, oh. <laughs> so do you, so, so do you currently use it um, for your clients? And yes, I do. Um, usually when doctors start talking about induction, we get ahead of it. If that's where they're going and you know my clients feel pressure, we get ahead of it and we'll start steaming. And I've had three clients so far successfully ditch induction and were able to go into labor naturally and had a great experience without all the cascading interventions and things like that. And they felt like they were also doing something, you know, that time when it's not 
active yet, but you're feeling contractions, things are going on. So it also, you know, because again, of course I suggest rest, but a lot of times no one wants to rest. <laughs> so it gave them something to do to feel like that was helping and that was moving. And even in, you know, the doula community, I've, I've had to remind people because they'll say, well, you know, it's contraindicated for pregnancy. And I'm like, absolutely. But at the end of pregnancy, after the 38, 37, 38 weeks, that's what we want to happen. It opens the cervix. So it definitely, me being a holistic doula, it's definitely added some tools to my little kit of things that I do that clients can do that I supervise and observe and watch and can kind of walk them through. And it's had good success for me. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, that's amazing. And then, um, and then do, are you a postpartum doula as well? I'm, I'm starting to, I'm actually gonna finally take my official course in the fall, but I do offer postpartum steaming because I took the course. So I do offer the steaming and I've had clients take the steaming and a lot of them, like, uh, they say, you know, they're surprised, especially my clients who've had other children. They're like, this recovery is going so much different. I try to get them like, so what do you think is different? I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what's different now that you didn't do before? They're like, steamy? <laughs> you know, just trying to help them, like, make that connection. Um, but I also do complete postpartum planning. So when we do our postpartum plan, I put a steam schedule in it for those clients who want it. You know, I have them like write that out, like when you're going to do it kind of to keep it accountable. Um, so they're really recovering, but it's been great. I've, I've been thrilled, absolutely thrilled. And it's definitely added to my practice. Wow, that's so cool. That's so cool. You guys, Naima is like the number one like uh, steam cheerleader. Like <laughs> when she knows that she gets it, she be telling everybody. It is so incredible. I love it every time. Um, all right, so Chantal, uh, let's hear. Um, I would love to hear for you to share your personal steam experience. Um, yeah, I think it was 2018. I, I went for a Mayan abdominal massage because I had been working on like getting my periods more regular and understanding what did I what I needed to support my my hormonal system and my cyclical nature and um, I was really curious about the position of my womb I remember a doctor saying my womb was tilted at some point but I didn't know what that could mean or how that might be impacting my reproductive health or my period health and um, so I remember finding a practitioner and before you begin the massage you start with the steam so that was my first time experiencing steaming. Um, the first time I heard about steaming was when I was living in Turkey the, the year prior to that. Um, I had befriended a yoga teacher who was selling wild crafted yoni steam blends, you know, throughout Turkey. And I remember she's like, have you heard of yoni steaming? And I couldn't place where I heard of it, but I knew I heard of it somehow. So she used to sell herbs. Um, but I didn't try steaming until that, that massage day. And the therapist, she had said to me, you know, I would highly encourage you to continue steaming as a regular practice. Um, so she gave me some guidelines on what to do. So I would just grab all my kitchen herbs and, you know, kind of have the home smelling like a pizzeria because I had like oregano and basil. And, um, but when I started to uh, hear more about the benefits of steaming and experiencing that myself in terms of helping to regulate my irregular period. Um, I got really curious. And when you were on one podcast, Kelly, and uh, the interviewer was talking about how steaming supported her in recovering from pelvic floor prolapse. And I was like, wow, steaming can be that beneficial. It's such a gentle way to make such a huge impact on a woman's you know, like reproductive health and sexual health, then why not? Why, why wouldn't I want to um, spread that and, and offer that to, to women? Um, and I think that's just that, that reparative nature of steaming just really helps you to, to really accept your birthing body, you know, if it, in the case of postpartum, and um, also to realize that your body is not defective or dysfunctional, you know, it's such a gentle way to bring up the support to the to the womb and so that's the 
I mean, there's rarely anything that I don't recommend steaming for. <laughs> People say, well, I have this going on or that going on, and I've yet to see uh, any pelvic condition <laughs> that isn't benefited positively by steaming. Yes. Okay. So you learn about steaming first and then during pregnancy and postpartum, were you able to then implement it for yourself? Yeah. So that was 2000. So I became certified. I certified with you in 2019. And, um, and so, yeah, actually when I had a, when I knew how to make <laughs> holistic blends, not just like kitchen herbal blends, um, I actually started to see shifts in my period and I, can definitely attribute one of my pregnancies to um, uh, the effect of steaming because I've never had 28 day cycles ever since puberty. And I was like, there's no way I'm ovulating already. I never have 28 day cycles. Like it's always like every 35 days, every 31 to 35 days. So there was one pregnancy that I feel like, man, that steaming really, <laughs> really works. And um, so that was uh, a pregnancy. I think that was I believe that was early 2020. Uh, unfortunately, that pregnancy didn't continue, but then steaming was there for me again to um, recover. And because I don't, I didn't have, I, it's not the first time I've had a loss and I didn't want medical care. I, for that particular loss, I didn't want an ultrasound. I didn't want anything invasive happening. So to know that I had steaming gave me a lot of comfort that, that's how I was going to tend to my womb. And there was actually a point in my recovery where I remember like a very foul smell in my discharge, which was very unusual for me. And I didn't know what to do about it, but I continued steaming and there was some leftover birth matter that the steaming was able to expel, even though it had been um, at least two weeks, yeah. you know, definitely more than a week after the loss, um, probably around the two week time frame, there was just a, a piece of tissue, you know, that was, that had been inside. And as soon as the steaming helped to release that, the odor left and, you know, there was no more, um, you know, no more to discomfort or, or what have you. Oh, and then um, I did go on to have another pregnancy that year. And that was my first time steaming, doing a uh, labor prep steaming. So I did steam at the end of my pregnancy leading up to the birth, I seemed in labor. And like you said, Sister Naima, like that time where you're not sure what you're supposed to do, it was very grounding. I was in that point of I'm, I'm not exhausted. I'm not feeling a need to do a lot of things. I'm not feeling a need to rest. Um, but it was very grounding to just sit on the steam and know I was supporting myself and, and preparing myself in a passive, proactive way for what was coming. So that was really helpful. So I seemed in labor, um, I believe twice. And the last time I steamed was about three hours prior to my birth. And um, and then after giving birth, uh, my placenta did not release right away. My placenta um, was retained for a number of hours and I had herbs. Um, I knew I wasn't hemorrhaging. I had all of the tools on hand that I had learned from you know, your course. So I knew what to do if I was hemorrhaging, but I wasn't hemorrhaging, just the placenta wasn't releasing and I was squatting. We had already cut the cord at that point. Chantal, I'm so sorry. Um, you actually, you accidentally got muted. Oh, no problem. Um, okay, so, so, you said, um, so you said that you were, you, you weren't hemorrhaging, but- I wasn't hemorrhaging. The okay. placenta was still inside, you know, I, the first hour I was just, you know, holding my newborn and, you know, my son was suckling, um, but I was still cramping because the placenta hadn't released. So we cut the cord and um, I had herbs. I was taking different herbs that were supposed to be helpful for releasing the placenta and I didn't see an effect. I was uh, massaging myself. Um, I was squatting, I was moving, I was praying and chanting and like there was no movement happening. And at some point, um, you know, it came to me that, well, steam always opens spaces. It always encourages release. And I already have, I already know what to do if any bleeding were to increase as a result. So I felt like it didn't hurt to 
to try steaming. And as soon as I, I heated up the steam, um, I sat for 10 to 15 minutes and then it was so effortless. The placenta just passed. I, I felt like I needed to move my bowels. I sat on the toilet and just had to grab the cord before, you know, it all went down the toilet. So, um, and that experience was really very, very um, insightful to me. And as I shared it with other birth workers, um, I've gotten a couple of calls from someone who's like, hey, you know, um, I'm at a birth, I'm at a home birth, and there hasn't been a release yet. What would you recommend? And so I'm really fascinated as to how steaming can be offered as a an intervention for a retained placenta before we get into, you know, the cord pulling and the manual extraction and um, Pitocin as a method of extraction. Oh my gosh, Chantal, you're just such a wealth of knowledge. And then you had this experience. And so Chantal came into my inbox. Mind you, she's got like a brand new baby, just gave birth when she said, Kelly, she said, do you, do you instruct about steaming to, re to release the placenta? Because I was just able to do that. And I was just like, no, I don't. I was like, but it's something that steaming absolutely can do. And she's like, I know, I just did it, you know? <laughs> like, and, so, um, and so we talked about actually the importance of sharing this with birth workers, because again, that, that we, we're getting into a dangerous area, right? Like this, one of like the leading cause of maternal mortality is hemorrhaging, okay? And hemorrhaging can happen because the placenta doesn't re release. So, you know, the idea of having that steam sauna there and accessible and available or even just the ability to steam because you can even do it with squatting just and somebody has to have the knowledge to do that um is just so important in a birthing environment that somebody on the team knows how to steam and in this case it was the birther her, herself right mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just like hey guys you know i'm gonna steam right um or, or, you know, knew that that was something that, that could help. But anyway, such, such great instinct that you did that. Um, something that I do think, you know, and, and the reason why I, I made sure that you were on this call is so that we can talk about this. I think what I've noticed with steaming is that people know that they can steam. Naima, you know you could steam for, five, you know, you had success with fibroids, right? So people are talking about steaming for fibroids. People are talking about steaming for, you know, BV right now, bacterial vaginosis, like this kind of like really where people know, okay, steaming really helps. But then people didn't know you could steam in labor. People didn't know that you could steam for labor preparation. People didn't, don't, you know, even now I've, I've been educating about those and, you know, trying to talk about them a little bit more publicly and still people don't necessarily know or haven't maybe thought of the fact that you could steam if the if the placenta isn't releasing right so that's where it is important that we have these conversations just so that we can think about it right like how this tool can be used in these different settings and and like how you said it it can prevent the need for you know something that um, some type of intervention that isn't natural at all um wow just so incredible um Okay, so Chantal, you have the experience steaming for fertility, for pregnancy loss, for labor, <laughs> inactive labor. And what and I'll say about the postpartum as first yeah, thing, and yeah. then for postpartum. Like you have yeah. the experience, the whole, whole birth work experience. Definitely. And so I would say that the, that, so that steaming in that window, I didn't have any postpartum cramping once the placenta released. There were no cramps. And I remember that from my first birth and my second birth very vividly, the intensity of those uterine contractions. And so getting that first steam in at that early window, you know, um, so it was five hours. My my placenta hadn't released for five hours. And after that, I didn't feel any cramping um, at all. And then I continued to steam for the entire 30 days. And to compare that postpartum recovery to the others, I mean, really was night and day. I remember after giving birth to my first daughter in a hospital where they told me I needed an episiotomy and vacuum extraction. It took six months for me to actually feel like my body was intact and whole again, you know? Whereas with steaming, uh, with this third pregnancy, um, well, I'll say the second pregnancy, I knew about rest to some extent. I didn't know about steaming, but I felt um, that recovery a little bit earlier, like at the three month mark. But with the third 
pregnancy and the third postpartum period period I remember it being two weeks in and I felt like wow like this is my body like we're good you know what I mean um we we don't feel mutilated we don't feel like we're falling apart you know and it's not that um that I needed to it wasn't about weight or anything else it was just the feeling of like my body feels like it's mine again you know my my vulva feels intact and supported not stretched or swollen or tender or you know out of commission <laughs> you know I felt together and intact and that was really uh, very pronounced for me wow and I love being able you know that comparison and Piper can also compare steaming postpartum versus you know her her um first where she didn't steam postpartum and and we'll get into that um but she's you know I, I know that Piper you said you saw a much faster you know faster you know healing with the with the steaming I um I steamed postpartum with my first and second birth so I don't have the experience of comparing it to not steaming but I definitely know full prolapse and an infection and everything. <laughs> okay. About 10 days. That's my, that's my time, you know, cause I see them you know, starting as soon as possible after giving birth. And so by, by 10, 11 days postpartum, I've already steamed 10 or 11 times and perhaps even more. And, um, I just feel like me, you know what I mean? Like I just started to put on my clothes, you know, I got my cute little baby and then I just, you know, I, I hang out at home. I do observe like, you know, um, the home you know staying home for 30 days at least but yeah and and that's actually when I started sharing steaming I didn't initially share steaming with anybody for about three or four years at home in secret like in hiding <laughs> and would never you know speak about it online or in public or anything I tried to tell somebody and they were like you steam you're wet and I was like no never mind I was just <clears throat> I was like how about the weather looks like a <laughs> you know, <laughs> looks like it's going to be a hot one. Like I just completely changed the subject. Right. And, um, but it wasn't until postpartum that, no, I didn't have the experience of not steaming, but all I know is once you become a mom, your mom friends now, you know, your other friends who have children, y'all start talking and, and this and that. And I just, what people around me were experiencing, what the other moms were experiencing was so different. You know, it's just like, oh, okay, you're still having incontinence. Oh, okay, like the yeah, the yeah, there is some pushing down, like, but that goes away, right? To me, that goes away because you steam and it goes away, you know. And that's originally when I started to to, to tell other people about steaming. It's when I um, lent out my steam chair. I just started to lend it out to my friends, you know, after they gave, I would take the steam chair and I would do a steam session for them and I would leave it at their house for them to steam. And it was really weird, you know, and that was like a little bit hard for me is like how weird it was for people. I remember one of my friend's husbands was like, this chair needs to go. It cannot be, you know, and I went, I had to go pick it up, you know, um, from their house because he said it couldn't be there. And this was in 2013. You know, so anyways, there was, you know, like a lot of strangeness around it, but I just, just like what I was experiencing postpartum was that my body had returned to its normal state. And it seemed like the people around me, the moms around me, their bodies had not, you know, and not only had their bodies not returned to the normal state, they were functioning with dysfunction as a reality, right? People are saying, oh, this is what we do because we love our babies. And that's like the sweetest thing ever. Oh my gosh, women. Oh my gosh, mothers. That they would even know that they have to make that sacrifice and do, you know, for their babies. But also, no, this is not acceptable that we just, you know, like, you know, have this self-sacrificing thing for these children and that we don't put the mom back together again, that we don't give her the care that she needs to fully recuperate and feel like herself. And like you saw, Chantal, like weeks you can feel like yourself all your organs can be functioning normally again you know when that steaming is there in that um you know immediately in that postpartum right and it's a big difference a lot of times people might steam but they might steam later a lot of midwives don't know about it or they're starting to hear about it so they're like okay let's steam it maybe after you have no more um no more loki after no more discharge and stuff and, and that's okay it's still good to steam then but like to have, you know, these postpartum steam practitioners trained to be able to steam immediately and be part of that birthing team in case the placenta is retained, in case um, there's other cases where um, there's bladder, uh, bladder retention, where somebody cannot urinate, 
steaming can be used it immediately helps the the urine to release like there's all these first aid situations that it can be used if it's available if the knowledge is there in the you know delivery room right so um okay it's not about me sorry i want to hear from you guys more <laughs> sorry I mean, uh, um, um, excuse me i wanted to find out from in this community um uh the action although all these things didn't take place i did my utmost best to introduce to my daughter and then i also did my best to introduce to my daughter to bring her center because she's been doing her best to say this is going on in my body her son is seven months old and um so i i'm not able to force her to listen to this conversation okay right i'm doing my best she's talking about you know why she can't get to the bathroom why she has to urinate and poo and stuff like i'm saying you're having a dialogue and i'm i need support i'm on here because i truly this conversation is not necessarily for me my daughter is talking but she's not talking and I have to have some truth. I have to be honest here. And um, you women are, are speaking a language and um, I'm not able to drag my daughter to this conversation. Um, it's not got, I don't feel a lot of gynecology issues. I feel that this is the dialogue right here. I have a box. I've been utilizing this box. I'm 62 and enjoying it. I was able to push, you know, to push it in, but not utilize, not be connected in, in this manner. So I, I didn't do a lot of homework, but I'm 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 in I'm I'm connected. So maybe three years I've been using my box. And I've only lent it to my daughter. And um, I don't know how to utilize this tool that's happening right now to intercede with my child that's 26 years old that birthed her baby at home quietly. I never birthed a child at home. I've always been in a hospital. I'm not able to let her know how powerful she is and she doesn't have to be in a state of transient. I'm in postpartum, but I don't understand. I don't understand how to support what's happening with you and your body and your son is now seven months and I just want to do a little bit. How do we, she's not able to get to the bathroom. She's not able to tell her triggers. Only thing I know how to say is get to the group home. If you're in a postpartum, I don't know how to react and respond, but just to get on here and do my best not to miss this for my daughter. I, I don't know. I have to speak up. I apologize, but I, I don't I don't want to put her in a hospital. I don't want to put her away. There's things that she's saying that you all are talking about, and I don't know how to force her to listen. Yeah, I, I hear you. Thank you so much, Auntie Janetta, for sharing that. You know, it's so um it's so hard. It's so hard to see somebody um, who doesn't and isn't able to recover all the way. And the people around them, you know, who are supposed to be able to help mm -hmm. are doing it. I find that a lot of people, you know, even if they do hear this conversation or even if they do manage to talk to me or Naima or somebody here, a lot of times they get blocked. They go to their doctor and they say, well, you know, somebody told me I could steam or my doula or my, my midwife or my friend and the doctor shuts it down or a nurse shuts it down. Um, and that's, I mean, honestly, that's why we're having this conversation. It's like, you know, we can do our best um, to have this conversation and then for people to be able to listen to this conversation, right? To be able to hear Chantal's you know, direct experience, her before and after, her the, the change between steaming and not steaming. And, you know, the hope is that people can hear those stories. And I think one of the first, to me, one of the first levels is actually to get all the birth workers 
all of the birth workers on board because we also have the midwives and doulas who block people from steaming. They're just like, no, you're not supposed to steam, you know, then, or no, steaming, I heard that it can cause an infection, right? And then that somebody might have had access to that and then they don't, <laughs> right? So I hear you, I hear you. I, I mean, I, I think like that heaviness is kind of like what sits on my heart daily. You know, people are, are dying, people are suffering. And I know that steaming can help, you know, and that's why I wanna show that midwives and doulas can use it and how they use it. People can use it themselves if they know how to use it, right? And then I also wanna go a little bit further and show that hospitals can use it too. That's why uh, last week I had a panel with doctors who recommend steaming, right? This doesn't have to be something that we also do separate from the medical system. I think every single birthing and delivery room, whether it's a hospital, birthing center, or at home, needs to have steaming there and the knowledge to be able to use steaming. And I know there's a lot of um, birth workers here who you know, are gonna now wanna immediately implement it. And I just want you guys to know there is some training involved, right? We do have the risk That's of- what I was actually going to say is please take the coursework and really understand it before you just start steaming people. That's truly essential. Like I went through the class, okay. I actually went through it twice just to make sure I knew what I was supposed to do because these are people and you don't wanna cause more harm. That's what you don't want to do. You do not want to be a part of the narrative. Okay. Like All right. Is. So it's a good thing that I stopped. I, I did it one time with my child. I knew, I just wanted her to have some ease, okay? So she, maybe it was two times. So I was able to guide her. So now, because someone guided me however many years and I haven't been trained. So that's this is a good point right here because- when I talk about it, people want to know. But this one, I live with my daughter. And having a uh, people you can trust to speak, to speak to, I felt like I did a soul research and then I tapped in and I brought you all to her and she, she didn't grasp it. It's not to disturb, but it's to give you leverage, tools to work with because my voice tells you to go outside if you're gonna go and do this. There is the tool that could give you what you need to assist you to get to the bathroom rather than me taking you to a hospital. And I believe it's this dialogue right here that's going on. This is what I, I'm just in a few moments. I've only been on here a few moments and I'm sensing um, um, the antennas, the information is perfect for her. Hmm. So I probably, my hope is, is that I'm probably having to correct whatever's going on with me to walk in the walk, take the action with myself, continue. I'm not able to, to have children anymore, but I am connected to this Yoni box. And I definitely would like more and more uh, um, connectedness. So then I can transfer somehow. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's not me shoving and pushing my daughter. Maybe it's, you know, me listening to y'all and taking guidance from you all. But I'm going to be quiet now and listen um, to um, y'all's directive. I, I just really, I appreciate the spirit for making me stop doing what I was doing so I can center myself. And this could possibly also help me nurture my grandson, which is nurturing yeah. his mama. Okay. You know, truly. I really thank you for speaking up um, because, you know, what you're doing is you're bringing in the real situations, right? The real, the real problem here, right? Like the real thing that we are trying to do, right? Is to get it to your daughter, right? Even seven months later. And you do know, and you do have a steam box. And yet still we're missing, you know, that first of all, there's, there's a couple of things. And that's one of the things that we want to talk about a little bit long uh i wanted to ask a little bit further like, what are the barriers to getting this to people what are those barriers you know and you're, you're mentioning them one is your daughter doesn't know she doesn't necessarily know why or, or what or realize that it's you know there are that she shouldn't be seven months later and still dealing with what she's dealing with 
you know, doctors will say this is normal. I had somebody come to me. She had been, she was like, I'm 12 months and I'm still, I still have my postpartum discharge. When is it supposed to stop? And she was like 22, you know, like a real young mom. And I, it doesn't matter how old she was. Apparently her, her doctor had told her, well, for some people it lasts that long, but we can put you on birth control or give you an IUD. And I, don't, I can't understand how any of that is a proper response to the fact that she's a year after giving birth and still bleeding. Like none of that is a proper response to that, right? And so part of the problem is the information people are being given that again, it is supposed to be okay or it's normal not to be fully recovered, not to have the body returned to its full function and state, right? Um, anyhow, I really appreciate you for speaking up, Ms. Janetta. And I wanna put a call out in the chat because there are so many people here who have taken my courses and postpartum and so forth, if anybody's available um, to do a consultation with Ms. Janetta's um, daughter. Okay, um, okay, so Sophie, uh, Sophia actually responded in the chat. So um, we, we, we I'm learning. Excuse me, I'm learning technology. I just want to tell you, I'm learning yeah. technology, okay? So I'm not like my daughter, you know, she's an octopus and me, I'm just learned how to push this one finger. Can you give us your phone number? Go ahead and just say it. And then Sophia. Okay. Yes, please. Let me, can, let me do that. 408-876-3429. And I text. I'm, I'm a, I can text. All right, thank you so much, Sophia. She's going to do, she's going to um, just, she said sponsor a consultation and she um, she grabbed your phone number and she's gonna reach out and text you. Yes. I'm gonna <laughs> listen, I'm gonna be quiet and listen now. Thank All you. Right, I love that. So now, um, it, you know, it brings up something else, which is like, you may not, we know, may, may know how to steam, right? but that may not mean that we're a birth worker or we may know how to steam and we may be a birth worker, but we may not know how to steam in birth work, right? There's specific steaming, you know, uh, protocols or I will say steam plans for steaming for labor prep. They change when you're steaming in active labor, they change when you're steaming <laughs> postpartum, right? And so um, there are so many people that are trained, you guys. I've trained like a, a thousand people. Okay, to me, that's a lot, you know? But I always encourage people to do virtual consultations. And the reason why is for every, okay, if there's only a thousand people trained in the world, right? And then there's also um, traditional and folk and cultural practitioners and they know what they're doing as well, right? But they're hard to find, <laughs> you know, like they don't have websites. So you either know them or you don't, okay? So they're also trained uh, with lots of experience. But for every thousand people, if I've trained a thousand people in the world, that's like, that's like a, you know, a, a, a million people that everybody, for every thousand, for each practitioner that I have, you know what I mean? Like that's a lot of people, <laughs> right? And so we need to, that's why I, um, I do encourage and um, all of my practitioners to do virtual consultations. Most of them do virtual consultations to be able to get, you know, to people and they can do video consultations. They can do intake forms online and so forth. And so that's what Sophia is gonna be able to do with Ms. Janetta and her daughter. So um, I think that's also, you know, an important thing. Um, I think midwives and doulas, I do feel like tend to be like, well, I know steaming and I'm a birth worker, so I know what to do. And it's like, Mm, let's let's just go ahead and walk through the situations, right? That's like what the course and doing some training can do is walking through these different situations and how the herbs might change for somebody who, um, you know, is bleeding a lot postpartum versus somebody who has no bleeding postpartum, right? And also what to expect. Um, <clears throat> I had a midwife who was just like, I'm a midwife, I steam, I do not need, you know, Class, I do not need a consultation. I said, you know what? I said, she was telling me the situation with her client. I said, you know what? I said, how about I connect you with a midwife so that you can do a consultation? Uh, why don't you just refer your client to do this consultation and work with this other midwife who's trained in steaming? And she said, no, she just, you know, couldn't understand the need. And, you know, again, a week later, she's in my inbox. Hey, you know, my client steamed and all of these clots came out. What do we do now? You know, like, you got to know what you're going to expect as well. Like with steaming yeah. postpartum, there are different situations that can happen with the steaming. You got to know if it's okay or not okay. It is okay for the clots to come out, 
but it's shocking. And this happens also when without guidance of anybody. They just like, I know how to steam, I'm gonna steam postpartum and that's fine. If you know how to read what's happening, right? There are a lot of people I get into my inbox and who call our lines that I just, you know, I'm two weeks, you know, I, I stopped bleeding. So, you know, I, I believe that I was safe to start steaming and I just steamed and all these clots came out, help, do I need to go to the hospital? You know, it's like, no, you're okay. You know, but even just knowing what to expect, that's not the only, you know, the, I'm giving that as one example, um, but there's different things to be able to expect and to know um, what to expect is important in this, in this time period. So, ah. Uh, I, uh, so anyways, so everybody knows we are recording this this conversation so that hopefully this will go out. I'm hoping that it goes throughout all of the birth working circles that we can get it to, um, that more people will listen to this conversation. Um, a little bit of background, I actually um, was uh, applied to uh, DONA to do a continuing education course for the doulas, um, for postpartum doulas, and they turned it down. They said no, um, and this was uh, about three or four years ago. Um, so I haven't, you know, re reapproached them. But I remember there was one person on the board in particular who was like, "I think that you should, you know, protest. I think that you should, you know, write a letter." And I was like, "Look, what am I gonna do? You know, like, <laughs> I do think that all doulas need to know about. It. I do think that all midwives need to know about it. But how do we get it to them? Right? We have to actually start. To, we have to start with." you know, doulas and midwives who do get it, who, who are using it, who are having those experiences. And then from here, we need to get to those schools, to the midwife schools, to the, you know, to the doula certifying organizations. We do need to start to get it to that institutional level as well. And then from there, we need to break into the medical institutions. Like, you know, there's no reason why, obs you know, obstetrical nurses shouldn't be trained and, and be able to set up a, a geriatric chair, which is available in the hospital, a pot, and maybe steam with some salt, right? In, in, a, in an emergency situation where you can use this natural, uh, you can use this while waiting for the doctor or while waiting, even if there was a situation where they were gonna do an intervention, right? Like, I just feel like it needs to be in every, every delivery room and in every postpartum, you know, situation. That's me, that's why I'm steamy chick. I'm, I'm here to get steaming back to the women of the world. And we got to look at these different situations. Okay, without any further, I, I'm gonna stop here because I want to hear from our experts today, the birth. So Pepper, I want to go to you next. I feel like you probably got a lot to say <laughs> at this point. Um, so the question, you can, you can jump in, you know, where the conversation is, has gone. And also the question that we were at was about when you personally started using steaming and when you use it for your clients. Um, okay, so my personal steam journey, um, I grew up in a very steam friendly culture. I grew up in Germany where going to the Kua or, or spa is sort of a very integrated part of society. And I was familiar with steam in a more general body setting um, and familiar with the idea that different herbs could impact our healing in numerous ways. So um, I then sort of rediscovered it for women's health in my college days um, and was really excited to see it happening at the Jim Jilbang the Korean spas. Um, and that's when I discovered other people who were also sort of using it. And it's really interesting what you said, Kelly, about it being kind of secretive because there was very much like a, oh, you know about this too? Okay, well, cool. It was kind of like a, a club, you know, a little um, club of awareness. So um, I wasn't really using it regularly myself at that point, was just making note of the herbs and, and kind of a nerd around um, natural health and holistic measures in general. And I think that I first began really integrating it into my practice around loss, <clears throat> which actually carries a similar, but maybe slightly darker stigma. And that it's not something that people are, at least at that point, were speaking as openly about. And I found it really um, just nurturing and gentle and wonderful to be able to offer a, a service, a practice, a ritual that would help not only with the physical recovery process, but also with the space taking that I think doesn't often happen enough around recovering from a loss and addressing the fact that it is a true postpartum experience 
we sometimes reserve our um, our postpartum protocols and our postpartum rituals for after a birth, you know, yielding a person. And so when, when we experience pregnancy loss, I think that m many families are bereft of tools to really mark the occasion and having something like steaming really just offered a space of ritual and a healing tool in one. So that was the first segue into the practice. And then I would say probably around, I've also been a, a, a strong proponent of postpartum ritual in general. I've observed um, a postpartum space for myself after all of my births. And so that was another thing that was really challenging to get people to embrace the idea of taking a whole month away from the world. Are you kidding? I want to have a, a, what is it? A sip and see at like three days postpartum. What are you talking about? Um, so that took a little bit of gentle loaming. And by, I would say probably around 2016, um, it, offering the steam as a sort of closing ritual to clients was a really helpful tool and something that people were, were ready to respond to and embrace. And so from that point forward, I think I, I started making just a sort of general postpartum wellness blend um, and offering it as a service as we were rounding out our um, postpartum visits. And I will say also that since that space, I now, uh, I think it was um, Naima who mentioned just using it for just about everything. And I now fi find it just, there are so many aspects that are somatic as well as the actual physical healing that we understand that come from steaming. So I find myself wanting to lean into it for many moments in clients and friends' lives just to offer not only what I know are very powerful healing properties, but also address some of the heart space that I feel can also be steamed. And so um, I think I most recently brought a blend to a friend who was um, going through the dissolution of her partnership and kind of wanted to clear out some of her past and move forward. And um, she found it to be really powerful ritual for her as well. And so I, I feel like they're just probably fewer applic fewer applications where it doesn't work. <laughs> Seeming is a good, um, good for all. Yes, I hear that. Wow, that's so sweet. I actually remember um, that pregnancy loss when you were like, I think I want to do this, you know, you were you were consulting with me um, about, the, you know, what what herbs would be safe. Um, will you share um, about your when you did the postpartum steaming like with yourself? Yes, so thank you. Um, so like I said, I've observed a pretty um, regimented postpartum space for myself following all, the births of all my children and my eldest is now 16. Um, so I was doing things like observing specific food intake and um, belly binding was something that my grandmother passed down to me. Um, and we also had pretty um, embedded protocols about like the opening of our postpartum sphere. So staying close to the bed and then moving throughout the house and then eventually leaving the home altogether. Um, and so I was already experiencing a more positive postpartum time frame than what I was sort of hearing reflected around me socially. So I could relate to what you said there, Kelly. But then in my most recent pregnancies, really integrating STEAM as part of the practice allowed me to really understand from an embodied perspective, the impact on my actual physical recovery. Um, because I, I thought I had it down, do you know what I mean? But when you, when you shared with me um, some of the postpartum protocols, I really noticed a bouncing back of the tissues, um, a resolution for some of the postpartum cramping. When you start to have several numerous children, those postpartum after, after sensations can be almost more intense than the labor itself. Um, yeah. And so I was really looking forward to some relief there with numbers six and seven and found it absolutely helpful in that way. Um, and feel like those probably resolved more comfortably than babies three and four um, postpartum. So that was a, a huge impact. And also, again, to the sort of somatic and space holding um, aspect, it was really nice to take that time. In my postpartum ritual space, my partner would prepare the herbs. It was, sometimes we would have sort of observed some family time. We could do it in, you know, I would just sit off in the corner and we'd have a family movie night. And it was helpful that my children could also witness this very normal 
um, very necessary postpartum recovery protocol. And so I felt like it was also just nice to take the space and have some intention around doing that. And I think that's something that really excites me about reclaiming steaming for our postpartum women, just the idea that yes, there are still ways to serve you. There are still, we're not done yet. This is still a process that's unfolding. Um, also with my most recent postpartum space, I observed a longer postpartum um, recovery protocol because we were doing something that we don't usually do, which was taking a very long journey following the baby, following the baby's birth. We usually don't really go too far before three months postpartum. And this time we had planned a pretty long journey um, right around two months. And so I was grateful to have, to feel like I, I could rely on feeling more invigorated, feeling up to the task because I felt like I had sort of a secret weapon to I don't want to say accelerate my healing because I really want to honor the fact that it's a process that takes its own time, but I felt like I had some fortification for my, um, for my healing protocols and I was grateful to lean into that and it worked. <laughs> wow. That's so cool. And yeah, like, I mean, you're a master of healing. Like you guys go to Piper. I want to send out everybody's, you know, contacts, but go to Piper's like Instagram. You're going to see Piper in, in a bikini because she lives on Hawaii and, she's always <laughs> on the beach. and she got these, she has these bikini shots and you're just like, what is going on here? You cannot fathom that this woman has birthed seven children, right? So she really does, you know, she knows all of the tools of postpartum healing and recovery. And that was even before she implemented steaming. So it was interesting for me to hear, um, you know, specifically Piper's experience with the steaming and that she did feel like it really helped, you know, like um, that it, it did help. And I also thought it was really cool how she had it set up because a lot of this is logistic, but her husband was the one who set up the steaming for her. Um, uh, you know, every, so logistically, you know, how do you do this in the household? Um, I know there's a doctor, um, Dr. Gallery Moda, and she is, um, she's a doctor in the UK. Um, and she originally started um, birthing tubs like in the UK um, in the 80s. So, you know, way before her time, way before what we have now. But she's originally from Sri Lanka. And what she was saying is that, yeah, back home in Sri Lanka, she said, you cannot tell that somebody just gave birth, you know, after a month because she steams. People in the household set up the steaming for her. And, you know, she looks like a virgin, you know, right? Whereas very different than, I think, like a lot of the culture that I grew up with or things that I heard is that like, after giving birth, women have gaping, you know, wide vaginas and, you know, this thing. But like, again, these are references to somebody not actually properly healing, <laughs> right? But she was saying, you know, what she wants is that every household has somebody in that household that's trained to be able to do that postpartum steaming um, so that the, the mom isn't missing that. She didn't necessarily think of it as something, you know, um, from the hospital or, you know, that you have like, you know, even a birth worker, that's just something that the people of the household are supposed to be able to know how to do. And I do think that we will move back to a place where we have that knowledge, um, you know, where we hopefully have that knowledge that there's somebody around, you know, um, I, I, it reminds me of in Haiti, in Haiti, they have like doulas or midwives. It's, these aren't people who have taken certifications. It's just that everybody gets trained for the most part to be able to offer support, to be able to do herbal baths, to be able to do herbal steam. So everybody's a doula, right? You know, and I just love that, you know, as well. Um, okay, so let's go to um, our dear Raquel. So the it's the same question to you personally. Um, we want to hear about your STEAM journey and then how you use it in your work as well. Thanks, everyone. I could easily feel like I'm just listening and like, oh, yeah, I'm participating in this panel. That's right. That's happening. <laughs> um, so much beautiful information I already shared. Um, yeah, I think my first experience as um, steam as a healing modality is with the temescals, with the sweat lodges, the nipis. Um, and then from there, my first like vaginal steam was after starting the process of, um, you know, reconnecting with, with, with this knowing that I would be working with, you know, uh, pregnant people with mothers and children and was, um, at that time, working with an organization called Shodini. And it was the, the space that I had first learned how to use my own speculum flashlight and mirror to look at my own cervix. 
And so the person who was running that, um, you know, boiled a pot of herbs and like put it in the toilet, closed the toilet. And then, you know, that was my first steam. And then I met Kelly and Kelly was like, we're going to be friends at like an event. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, you seem cool. Back when you were doing uh, um, chick food um, and you made the best like uh, steam tea, you made the best, you know, or I'm sorry, not steam tea, um, like period tea um, to drink. So I had one of your OG chairs. I got one of your OG chairs and you you drove and you, you set up a steam for me in my apartment, you know, and we chatted. And so so I started with with steaming in that sense, always kind of has always made sense to me on an intuitive level. Um, you know, it's always been like a, oh yeah, yeah, of course that's gonna work. Um, so similarly to like all of you, you know, I'm I I recommend steaming. I feel like everybody who has a uterus um, or identifies as a woman, really, and then I can expand that even anybody who has genitals, like, should be steaming on some form or another, you know, like, everyone should have a steam box, steam chair, stool, whatever, you know, steaming apparatus, and should be steaming um, for our general health and well-being um, of our creation anatomy. You know, regardless of what you want to choose to create, that's our creation anatomy. Um, and so it's important to take to take um, care of ourselves in that way. So so I think definitely started steaming on my um, for myself. And then, you know, I took I took my steam chair to midwifery school. Did I really use it? No, because that was, you know, kind of a traumatic experience. Um, but and my period was like, I'm out like. This environment is not conducive for you to have a cycle. So I'll see you when, you know, your adrenals are not so shot. <laughs> and so like, I kind of didn't have a cycle really for like, you know, the two years that I was in midwifery school, um, maybe a couple discharge here, you know, sometimes I'd try to have sex to like bring on my period and things like that. And sometimes every so often I'd have a steam, but, you know, I was kind of okay with not having a period throughout. It was just like, okay, I know this is stress related. And, and so when I came back to LA, like, you know, um, Kelly was just starting, you know, I think I was part of your second cohort of teaching. And again, it was just like, oh yeah, this makes sense. And this makes sense in a midwifery sense. This makes sense again for the uterus in all its phases specifically, um, so, you know, I took that course and, and have been implementing it in my practice ever since. Like my clients all know from the jump that they're going to be steaming at 37 weeks. I'm going to be steaming into the postpartum um, and clients that I've, you know, throughout the process that we've had, you know, a pregnancy loss arise, like have been able to support that process and in, 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 in still, in still healing, um, in still maneuvering and still going into that, that's still a, a shift, that's still a birth of something. Um, you know, at Sugar Heel Gang, who I'm, who I'm part of, you know, we call those births Sugar Heel, SHG, what, what, represent. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we call those Phoenix births, we call those Phoenix risings because they're diff there's a different energy to them. So the steaming is, is part of that facilitation of that initiation um, that takes place. And then, yeah, steaming for conception. I use it, you know, I usually have someone who's trying to, trying to get pregnant, someone who's like going through some type of pregnancy loss and then someone who's trying to have a baby. So, or like is about to give birth. So I'm constantly kind of in this, like the cycles of the uterus um, and the implementation of, of using steam um, in that, in that journey. And yeah, I, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's how I use, that's how I implement it in my practice. It's just there. It just feels so fluid to me, like for me, fluidity. Um, and I think, you know, I think as birth workers, I'll have to say, especially as midwif mid midwives in having maybe the experiences I've seen with, with midwifery care, 
um, I'll say, because you said we have a lot of birth workers here that, you know, there's this pressure sometimes to like go out and like service everybody. And from the jump, I always knew like, I don't want to be everybody's midwife. I mean, it took me like those of you all who know me on this call, like know that it took me a long time to even call myself a midwife and to practice openly as a midwife for various of my own spiritual journey reasons, because the way midwifery is generically practiced in the U.S., but in in different places throughout the world um, is not sustainable and is very much fitting this white patriarchal framework of care to be like, but if we can fit into your framework, then like, we're okay. Right. Right. And I've always been like, that's just not sustainable. So I think for me, even entering into steaming was always as a a peri steam hydrotherapist and working with, you know, Kelly, um, to teach and other things has always kind of been, a um, part of like my sustainability, (laughs) uh, goals, you know, like I can't catch babies forever. Um, you know, I don't want to be on call forever. Um, or sometimes that's just not how my life is flowing to have that. And so steaming and still, but I, but I love the uterus. I'm great at communicating with the uterus, you know, we homegirls and, and so steaming and implementing that has been part of like my own, you know, my own abundance in reclaiming, like how I'm taking care of myself and how I'm taking care of my community in a safe, sustainable way. And I feel like steaming always brings me back to my own sovereignty and is what I encourage, you know, in, for my clients and the families that I work with. And, and that's just like creating a whole new system. So, so I'm also implementing it for that. And I feel like I've just went on a random tangent because, you know, that happens. But, uh, <laughs> you said, cause that happens. <laughs> no. Uh, just so you guys know so I am not a birth worker I'm not trained as a birth worker and nothing I have given birth I'm a birth giver and I instinctively used steaming for labor preparation with both of my babies I didn't use it during labor I didn't have any you know instinct to do it but when somebody a doula told me oh I use it during labor I was like oh interesting you know and that makes sense right I had no instinct to do it and I also used it postpartum I had heard culturally that in African traditions it's used as for postpartum recovery, specifically in Ghanaian tradition. And so, you know, I used it postpartum having no idea what was gonna happen. I went into it blind, just like, you know, I'm gonna do something and I, I like steaming and I've used it for my period care. I'm gonna use it for my postpartum care, right? Um, but, you know, once I started, you know, um, basically what happened was people started texting me, hey, I heard you have steam chairs. I hear you have steam herbs. And so I started providing steam services. Really, I started making steam supplies for people, word of mouth around LA. And then somebody wrote a blog. And then all of a sudden, hundreds of people were messaging me. And, you know, when people were asking me about postpartum steaming and labor, you know, all these different things, I don't, ha- not having that birth work experience, you know, I went to Raquel because Raquel was the midwife I knew. I, I met her, she was, you know, as a, as a, as a educator, an anatomy, anatomy educator. Then she was a doula and then she was a midwife and she took her steam chair with her to midwifery. She always brought it. She never questioned it. And very, very quickly, I had both doulas and midwives shame me and tell me that steaming should not be used. It's dangerous, you know? So I went to Raquel and Raquel was like, what? that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, she just, she was like, of course, steaming needs to be used. Of course it would be helpful. Right. And she said specifically, I cannot be a midwife without steaming. This is how we care for the uterus, right? Like it's important for my care. It's important for uterine care. Right. And she just always got it. And so I asked her, I said, okay, will you be the steamy chick midwife? So Raquel's also the steamy chick midwife. She's my supervising midwife. Anytime I do have those questions, I can come to Raquel. And for a lot of the um, birthing clients or, you know, potential clients that come to me, I would refer them directly to Raquel for several years that she would then do the consultations with them and provide the guidance for them, right? Because that just makes sense. And so um, 
It was so interesting to me, Raquel, you were the first midwife. And I think it was because I knew you before you were a midwife. I wasn't intimidated because the midwives, you know, especially at first were very intimidating to me, you know, like, who are you, you know, in this space? Who are you, you know, like talking about steaming for birth clients? Like you shouldn't be talking at all. It's kind of like what I was, you know, getting told, <laughs> right? And you were the first one that was like, um, I think every midwife needs to have steaming as part of their, like as one of their tools. And I cannot be a midwife without it. And I was just like, oh, that's so awesome. Okay, so that's why I was like, I'm gonna stick close to Raquel. Like I'm just gonna stick close to Raquel. Like wherever she is, that's where I'm gonna be. Because you were the first one that can get it. And I feel like, you know, with all things, it's like, it's gonna take doctors to educate other doctors about the benefits of steaming. Like I can be the one there, you know, maybe I can do these panels, but you were the first midwife that openly accepted steaming and spoke about it. And that's why like, I'll, I'll be putting quotes, you know, I always put quotes and put you up there. Midwife Raquel says, you know, the steaming is good for postpartum, right? Because it, it was that voice, it was that authority with that education, you know, to be able to accept it. So I just wanna, you know, let everybody <laughs> know that. Um, that Raquel is, that's why she's the steamy chick midwife. That is why I sent so many um, birth clients her way. Now, finally, after, you know, um, th those first courses that I did were in 2017. Now, after five years, there are a considerable number of midwives um, who are steamy midwives, right? Who offer steaming, who make this available. And I think they also sometimes run against some that same you know, um, that same thing, which is other midwives that are like, why are you doing this? But at least they can have a conversation as peers, right? About why it's beneficial. And um, anyways, I just love you to death. And, you know, um, I think it, it was so interesting. Um, last week, Raquel sent me a, a, a video of um, midwives in Colombia doing steaming. And Raquel, you know, comes from Colombia. Her, her ancestry comes from Colombia. And, um, and I was like, okay, no wonder you got it immediately. You know, I know you're connected with your ancestors. So even though you had did, weren't in Colombia learning from those midwives, you just immediately were like, yeah, this is what we do. This is what we do. This is what midwives do, right? And you just got it without even necessarily having that book learning, right? But now we want to get to that book learning. We do want it to be part of the training of birth workers everywhere, <laughs> right? Um, but that was um, just one more thing that I would share is that um, I have a master's degree in international development. So I love like international topics. And when I first learned about steaming, I learned that it was Guatemalan and then Ghanaian and Korean. And I was just like, okay, I was just taking rec like notes, you know, and now I've found over 70 records of steaming worldwide, some of them in ancient, ancient books, some of them in corners, you know, in small little indigenous circles where only, you know, like there's no health care and the midwives still do it. Um, there's four countries in the world where steaming is universal practice and they're all tiny countries. We have Palau, Suriname, Eritrea, and then Korea. You know, these are the only countries in the world where it's universal there. Everybody just knows about it, right, and uses it. And so I've been doing that, you know, learning, and I have on my website the Vaginal Steam World Map for those that are interested in learning more about the, the history of steaming or the, you know. And so ultimately, when I look at all these records, they're not all in Africa. They're not all in Asia. They're all over the world. And so I've been able to make the conclusion, well, steaming is a universal practice. It just got lost somewhere along the line, which is more, more research that you have to do. Why did it get lost? But it's a universal practice. And out of all of the, these countries, some of them use steaming for this purpose. Some of them use it for fertility. Some of them use it for infections. But every single one of those places, steaming is used for postpartum. It is an original midwifery practice whether that's, you know, the formal midwives as like we have set up in our system now, or whether it's like in Haiti where everybody's a doula and, and midwife, right? Because everybody just has that knowledge in the home. Um, it is universally used for postpartum care. And so I think that was, um, you know, like what I, you know, was it was so it was so wonderful that you embraced it because I was like, this is the original. Like, <laughs> this is always. I know midwives have their their bag. You know, this is in the midwife bag. You know what I mean? Like, steaming is one of those things that can be used 
and we see um, how many things that it can be used for and how much faster you will see healing and the return of the body back to the pre-pregnancy state, um, we understand why, you know, it can be used for that, you know, retained placenta. It can be used when somebody can't go to the bathroom. It can be used when there's prolapse. It can be used when there's swelling. It can be used for all of these different things, you know? So I, it really makes sense to me that that is something that was universal, you know, in midwifery care. Um, at least historically, and then still in certain places. And I want to get back to that. <laughs> That's what you guys are always going to find with me. I believe in steaming. You guys, I believe in steaming. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about logistically, what does this look like? So I want to know, like, logistically, how do you set up? Do you make a chair? Do you have a chair? Do you have a sauna? Like, how do you steam with your clients? Naima, let's start with you. Yes. So basically, um, I have one of your um, steam practitioners, of course, the names eluding me right now, but I have a portable chair that I use and that I take with me. Now, some clients, depending on, again, what I try to do is when I'm in the window, I kind of drop off supplies. But for some clients, they'll call me like, oh my gosh, this has started. Like, oh, okay, we're here. <laughs> and so I'll instruct them Usually the easiest way is to do the bowl in the toilet just to get started because again, the steaming is with no heat for the, for the prep and um, they can bring it to a boil and they can sit, get up, do some things, come back and sit. So that's how I've used it and I've had really good success with that. Okay. So for labor prep, you might just educate somebody how to grab supplies at home and yeah. do it. I usually, like I said, I usually try to drop it off, but then, you know, Sometimes you'll, you'll get the people out the window or you know, beforehand. And so in that case, I've instructed how to do it. Okay, so tell me about dropping off your supplies then. So you'll drop I'll, off? Yeah, I'll drop off the supplies. I'll drop off the chair, the pot. I have pots. And again, they could either boil with no, no, nothing, but I like lavender just seems to, that's my go-to, that just that relaxing, you know, relaxation, hydration, and movement gets the baby out. So that, that just ma and makes people feel all automatically like less tense, which is all part of it, right? The body has to relax for anything to happen. So that's kind of what I drop off. I do ask them though, before they, they start, if I'm not there, like it's really, really early and they just wanna do things. Now, again, the beauty of technology, I do Google dual groups with my clients. So it's usually me, my co-doula and the family. And so they can call all of us at once and we're all there just to make sure that like, is that too hot? You know, because again, some of the misconceptions about steaming, it's like, well, if I sit, it's going to be too hot. Well, then don't sit if it's too hot. Like, you know, just make sure that people know, like if it's too hot for your hand, I don't want you to sit on top of it. So sometimes that is also where people are like, I've gone, it's been too hot. I went to a spa and it was just way too hot. So again, making sure I walk them through, show me the hand test, okay, you know, show me the water, let me see it because I want it to be as safe as possible. Yeah. And really walk them through, you know, the cover, you know, it's not working. I'm like, well, where, you know, what, how are you gonna catch the steam you know, for certain clients, things like that. So really observing it so that again, we don't have that, like it's not working da, da, da. so I try my best to see as much as I can to really help and when they have questions I'm right there to walk them through and give them extra instruction I love it okay Chantal go ahead um and let us know I know you support people virtually you said and both in labor and postpartum as a steam practitioner what do you do with your clients how do how do they get their supplies when I did offer in-person services, then I would have the option of renting a stool for the labor prep into the postpartum period, um, or people could invest in a stool. But I just find for um, very pregnant folks to squat and kneel, it kind of can be a deterrent. I find that just making sure they're set up with a proper box or seat or stool will facilitate them con being consistent with the practice. So I would um, have a rental option or a purchase option. And then we would work that out when we begin working together in advance, as well as all the herbs that they need, they'll need and kind of have an entire package. Um, so virtually the way that they work it out is I'll refer 
um, clients to practitioners who are in their locality so that they can get their herbs supplied, um, the stool or the box that they're going to use. They have time to secure that before they actually need it. And, um, and then I just coach them, supervise them. So we'll do some consultations and then they'll also have consistent access for questions, um, check-ins until we see them all the way through to the postpartum. And you do video conferences with them? Yeah, yep, we do our consultations on Zoom. And uh, just hearing uh, Naima speak, it brought up to me something you said, Piper, about the space holding. Um, when we talk, when I talk to clients about the heat, you know, people are like, how do I know the right temperature? Um, someone once asked me, how do I know it's not burning my insides? And I said, how do you think your insides would burn without your outsides burning? Like if you have nerve sensation, you know? I, and so I think it, there's an opportunity for us to remind women, um, to remind folks how to be an authority over their bodies, you know? Does it feel good to you? Does the temperature feel good to you? Can you trust yourself to know that you're not gonna burn yourself, you know? Um, and then also the idea that for things to work, they, we have to endure pain. We have to endure hardship, no pain, no gain. The hotter, the better, turn it up, you know? And, and so that's also been a, a, an interesting space holding that tends to come around this. Like, can you trust yourself with hot water? <laughs> and because uh, you're gonna, you know, you, there's a baby coming, you know, there's, there, there are bigger, there are <laughs> bigger challenges and, and bigger spaces where you're gonna have to learn to cultivate that inner authority. I got muted again. You're gonna, it's okay. You're gonna have to cultivate that sense of, of sovereignty, like you said, Raquel, and like inner authority over, I can, I can make a judgment, an accurate judgment if I'm doing something that's helpful or harmful to my body in this space, you know? Okay. There we go. <laughs> there we go. How do you find the STEAM practitioners in this person's area and the STEAM supplies in their area? How do you find that? Uh, so I definitely use the STEAMY Chick directory. Um, I only refer people to other practitioners who are certified. And then um, there are a few that I know personally and I'm familiar with their customer service and how well they package and deliver. So I have like around the world, I have like I have Liberty in Dubai, I have Sabrina in the US, and I have Habiba in the UK. Those are the main three, um, you know, regional suppliers that I refer people to. I don't go like state to state, city to city. Wonderful. Okay, so there is everybody a directory at stimicic.com backslash directory, or just go and say find a practitioner, and you can find the certified practitioners around the world. And you can actually filter who's certified in postpartum or who's certified in labor and find those practitioners. And they may be really far away from you, but there may be somebody nearby who makes steam saunas and herbs, right? So that's where what Chantal is doing. Chantal's offering the consultation because she's highly educated and has done a lot of the modules and can do the steam plans in these different situations. But then she works with the local, the more local suppliers to either ship or, um, or deliver the actual steam supplies. So uh, really important to know that, you know, these women, <laughs> sorry, not all my practitioners are actually women. These, these uh, steam practitioners are here. They get steaming, they love, they're making steam saunas, they're making steam herbal blends. They're doing these consultations. Let's use these resources until the chance that we get to, until we get to the point where just everybody knows about steaming and like, you know, anybody within your arm's reach could, you know, could could um you know do that consultation or set up that steam sauna let's use these practitioners so anyways that's what Chantal is using which is really awesome to see how you do that all right so Piper how um how logistically do you do steaming with your clients oh so inspired by what Chantal just said um and interesting I feel like some of that energy is exactly what influenced my early logistics um the idea of eliminating this barrier of like misconception around our agencies. I do think that people um, felt intimidated or overwhelmed by utilizing herbs, which is interesting because really water is sufficient as well, off many times. And it was more, the barrier was less around the herbs and more about assuming responsibility for one's health in, in that way, in a way that we are conditioned not to. So, 
when I, um, in, the, in the early days of offering this to my clients, I really made a point to not bring setup materials and to source from their environment. And for me, that process was, was collaborative with them. You know, they're telling me, well, grab this over here. Well, now that I think about it, I have this basket over here. You know what, use this pot, uh, you know, in the back of the closet behind this. And it was really a process of reclaiming the tools of, of building that confidence and saying, actually, I do know what I have available in my, in my kitchen. And can I actually heal myself with things that I use every day? Um, so even now, often when I, when I use it in a more ritual space with people healing, um, I, like to, I, I like to use things that they are still using in their everyday life. And I feel like it creates this association like, oh, this is the pot that I see when I'm doing my regular cooking, but I know that that's the one pot that I actually favor for this practice because it fits in my basket a certain way. And it just keeps the, it keeps our access to that concept of agency and sovereignty more, um, more alive, you know? And so I feel like it really, um, it just reintegrates the healing practice into our lives. So initially, logistically for me, it was about sourcing from what, what clients had. And inevitably there were materials that we could use. You know, we, we've used so many different, different things to create comfort and always, if, if nothing else was available, which is very rare, then of course there's always the toilet seat. Um, and so I, I felt confident that we would be able to pull together something. Um, Fast forward to now where it is a much more common, more sought after um, practice. I find it helpful to have um, tools that I can just deposit. I think that uh, Naima was saying that earlier as well, being able to just drop off with some instructions. Sometimes people are already familiar with how it needs to work and with just like a blend and maybe a setup that it's easy for them to walk their partner or their helper through. It seems a little bit more um, uh, logical than rigging it from several different supplies. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so there's a, there's a local midwife here who designed a really great uh, steam chair that was for backpacking. So it's just a very simple chair that you can put on a bucket. I actually posted a picture prior to our conversation of me using it in my postpartum. So you can see a five gallon bucket, not glamorous, highly practical. So I do favor uh, dropping that off with people these, these days, um, just because it, it feels fun. It's like, reminds me of the days when we would drop off the birth tubs and that was becoming a more popular thing. And people were so excited for birth tub delivery day. And now it's similar with the steam throne as we call it, of, oh, it's here. That means we're getting into this window. It's almost time. So I, I like that aspect of it. Um, and then of course, I'm really excited here in, in Oahu to be able to refer to Tamar as well. We have um, actually a, a couple of um, Yoni steaming spas available here. And this particular practitioner is highly skilled and just a wonderful person to work with. So it's, I, I really embrace the sort of both end ethic around it. I'm still very much team DIY because I really believe in that movement of reclaiming the tools. But I also love that you can also treat yourself, go and have a spa day with somebody who knows exactly what they're doing. Any and all, you know, all of it. It's kind of like the way you pretty much you wash your face daily with what you have keep on hand, but that doesn't mean that you might not want to go for a facial one day at the spa. So it's sort of a both and experience um, that I believe around it. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up, Piper. That's awesome. And by the way, you guys, I went to Piper's house. She really is a do it yourself because I saw several chairs, you know, I saw a chair, I saw a bucket. I was like, what's this? Up? like you know <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because that's actually a really fond memory that I have with you as well I, that's one of the things that I really thought was invigorating back in the chick food days or I loved hearing you shout that out when it was like a collaborative space people were talking about I tried this I'm trying to address this does anybody have any ideas about this and people would often post their little setup rigs and so it was really exciting to be talking with you, Kelly, who was really um, very much invested in that idea. There, there was not a seat that didn't have potential in Kelly's eyes. <laughs> and I appreciate that because it's so true. And, and it's just really empowering. And then also I really love as a business model, the way that you have um, supported so many other people in their various incarnations of Steam Thrones. I have seen more boxes and more art come through that space. People are really taking their love for what they're experiencing, taking that space that's created when you have a little healing to actually reinvest in, in the tool and beautify them. And it's been really inspiring watching 
that come along as well. So I feel like this wave of reclamation is really adding to the medicine, you know, multiplying the healing effects. Totally. Okay, Raquel, will you let people know how you do steaming? Don't forget to mention all of those steam chairs you have and how you do the circles sometimes too, okay? Because Raquel's got like, she's got a fleet of steam saunas. Right now, I, I actually only have mine. I'm, I'm down in the fleet sauna, but I, I definitely feel like we should have like a steam chair museum for, you know, some of the reasons you all are talking about, like, you know, that OG chair that Kelly made me was just, you know, a chair that she got from, I think, Habitat for Humanity or something store and a toilet seat. And I love that chair. Like, I'm really kind of low-key sad that I don't have that chair anymore because I ended up just using it later for, like, a composting toilet <laughs> and gave it away. Um, and then, yeah, and then I've had, like, the I've had the boxes. I've had the fold-up, the, the portable ones, which, to me, I really loved the portable ones when I was, like, super mobile and doing a lot of like in-person steaming for folks um, just to have a chair that would fold up and and take that I could take wherever um, and yeah I've seen the gamut of resourcefulness um, and I do I think when I've done my individual consults with folks that's what I encourage the most like people especially going through like their own uterine health and they're at that start of that reclamation um, you know I often yeah get pictures of buckets get pictures of like different yoga blocks that they've set up and um, you know all kinds of like chairs all kinds of different chairs lawn chairs without the cushion like so many just different different things and so I definitely really appreciate that setup um and then of course I'm including you know my favorite is just including the the res the the, the resources and the steamy steamy chick marketplace to go check out um to see if anybody is in local in your environment who can who can get it um with us and my team at sugar heel we've got jade on our steaming now so i'm not i'm not for our postpartum and um birth clients i'm not i'm giving counseling and guiding and supervising but jade is the one who um is putting together all our steam blends so all of our clients um that we work with get individualized blends specifically for them and kind of Yes, it's for labor and birth, but it's a lot of, I think, both of what, you know, Chantal and Piper and Naima have mentioned about, like, just the beyond the physical nature of, of steaming, the down regulation, the emotional aspects. So we get herbs also to address those things. Um, and lately, what's been really working for us, because I love a chair with a cushion for postpartum and pregnancy, because, like, you know... They just can't play like you can't play like that anymore like you I feel like you're pregnant you're creating new life you are a goddess you are a queen like you deserve some royalty you deserve a chair with a cushion so so the ones that we've loved at Sugar Heel Gang are actually are actually the yoga the yoga handstand chairs so Ooh. because they have a built-in cushion you know <laughs> so those have been really working for us so you know at 36 weeks they get a delivery from jade with all of those supplies their steam bundle there and it's very much like piper said like yeah they're like you know excited for that day they're in their window when can i start how can i you know um and it's really sweet. And then I think I just take the time. I mean, we always take the time to explain, you know, what to do. I think for the pregnancy and postpartum for folks, I definitely try to include, um, you know, at least a visit with the, making sure that the partner understands how, how to set it up, you know, at a certain point, because it can be empowering, I think, for the pregnant person and the mother to do it while they're getting ready it's like a nice thing for them to take time and get their thing and set it up and it's their down regulation and they can you know netflix and chill with their family or whatever um but in the postpartum i'm like you are not doing that for yourself anymore you know until at least three weeks you know then you can reclaim it so it's really important that somebody else knows that how to set it up whether it be a grandmother or an auntie the doula or their partner um having that that steam set up for sure yeah and i think it's an important point of like bringing in the family again it's like such a 
um, easy point to like get somebody else to to learn how to take care and respect and bring back that res respect of the divine feminine. Um, and oftentimes, you know, I I'm one of those who recommends steaming for sex, you know, um, especially if there's some like, you know, some tenderness happening or some pain happening. So I really encourage like whoever you're having sex, like help them to be a part of it with, you know, like get them to do the setup with you, get them to like be a part of it. So they're like, Oh yeah. Okay. That's, it, it just makes it more exciting. So, <laughs> so those are a couple of the setups that. <laughs> Raquel, you have so much experience. And for those that don't know, Raquel has a birth collective called the Sugar Hill Gang. She's the midwife in her birth collective of, of, um, of healers or of birth workers. So she does the midwife work and now she works in her birth collective with a steam facilitator. This is another really great model. The midwife doesn't necessarily need to be the person that you know is specialized in that. Raquel is, so she can supervise, but you can also work hand in hand with mm -hmm. your with a steam facilitator who can do that part of it, who can do those intakes, who can be in charge of those supplies, those herbal blends, and so forth. So that's how um that's how Raquel is set up right now, which is really cool. Um, Raquel yeah. did buy 10 steam saunas from some, a local, you know, from a local mm -hmm. provider that had cushions on them. Cause she was like, this is what I need for my, for my you know, birth clients. Right. So she had the cushion seats and she also used to do circles with people, right. Yeah. Educational circles and, and, and Yoni steam circles. Right. So there were so many different, there's so many different things you've done, Raquel. You're so dynamic. You're are, like, yeah. yeah. I, I sold all those chairs. Those chairs yeah, went she sold all those. <laughs> and now she's set up with a steam facilitator who's in charge of doing the specific steaming she was a supervising client for me uh sorry she was a supervising um a practitioner for me for a long time where I sent all of my birth um clients her way for steaming for pregnancy loss and and um, birth she's no longer doing that now she's more actively attending births but at that time she wasn't and so she was you know she was working with people virtually as well so this is like you know just showing the very various different ways that a midwife can do this um can do this practice so um really really cool okay cool so you guys we um we i want to make sure that we get to um talking about we have, um, you know, brought it up, steaming for pregnancy loss, steaming in postpartum. We've talked about it for fertility um, and we've talked about it in labor. But what I would really love is if you guys would be willing to share case studies, like, you know, a specific case of steaming <clears throat> um, in, in one of these situations. Um, you know, like for example, for labor, um, one time, um, a doula came to me and she, she actually, you know, hit me up, you know, how doulas do in the middle of the night. And she had somebody who was stalled, who was stalled in labor. Uh, she had been having contractions. She was completely stalled. Um, there were some other issues. There was a lot of distractions. Her husband wouldn't get off the phone and there was just like, you know, a lot going on, but this woman just completely stopped. She hadn't slept now in a couple of days and her contractions stopped and she was attempting to do a home birth. But at this point, it looked like they were going to have to transfer her to the hospital. So I, you know, this was actually nearby. So I, I went over, I took my steam sauna. She sat on the sauna. She was like, all of a sudden, so relaxed. This woman was very exhausted. And so she was so relaxed. And then she went and she had a very deep sleep for eight hours and woke up with contractions and those contractions progressed and she was able to have the baby like not very many hours after. I think it was like two or three hours after you know, wake, waking up and that deep sleep, which is, so that steaming to me, it helped give her that relaxation. It helped make her body more comfortable. She had said specifically that it helped her take away a lot of the pains that she was having. And that's why she, you know, and then it just helped her feel so relaxed. So this woman had a very deep sleep, a very long sleep, and she hadn't had a stretch like that in a long time. <laughs> and then she woke up and had her baby. So that's an example of steaming you know, in active labor, in a situation where the labor has stalled. So um, Chantal, you also shared your experience of steaming for the placenta, you know, when the placenta wouldn't come out, which is a really great story. So I'm going to pass it over to Piper and Raquel. I don't know if you guys have any specific stories um, of steaming, you know, in any one of these situations, postpartum labor, pregnancy loss, or fertility um, that you think that other birth workers should know about and how steaming can be used in this specific situation and what this looks like. 
I'll go um, just because I'm, I'm tagging on to your long sleep aspect. Um, I'm thinking of an experience with someone who was experiencing pregnancy loss and um, had been for sort of Western consultation, which is very matter of fact, like we have determined this is no longer viable. And so therefore we should have this procedure to rid you of all material contents and send you on your way with typically very little follow-up unless there is some emergent issue presenting. Um, and this is someone who just really had been ambivalent about the pregnancy initially and then had some feelings of ambivalence. Well, not really ambivalence, but conflict around parting. And I think just needed time to process. Um, so chose to opt out of the medical procedure, um, you know, a DNC essentially, and just wanted to come home and sit with it and was advised to come back in a particular window of time if things hadn't resolved naturally. Um, you know, it's interesting how much time was given for that process to complete um, and just, and so was feeling very conflicted about the paradigms that they were straddling, like wanting to have some space for completing this cycle and integrating this Phoenix. Um, and then also feeling tugged as though the responsible thing to do would be to adhere to the Western protocols. Um, and so seeming felt like a wonderful way to hold space, to be proactive and yet also patient um, and to have, you know, I feel wonderful as a practitioner to also be able to just engage people in this space with a little bit more compassion, um, with being able to bring some expertise about what physically needs to transpire, but also marry that with um, some space, uh, you know, a, a less uh, regimented time frame. So anyway, uh, after this person steamed, they too had a really long nap. And I typically try to stay for a window following just for aftercare, especially in a loss situation, but this was a long nap. So I was able to leave and sort of ask them to check in, we left a note, you know, check in when you uh, wake. And I was impressed with how long it was. And I thought in that time frame, you know, this is a re reintegration period. This person really hasn't been able to rest and sit with this information, especially because we don't often talk about what's happening when we're experiencing loss. So there's expectation that we still perform our daily life duties. And so I think that in those spaces that we have to just be quiet for a moment when we're feeling conflict, those can be a little bit um, blown up with non-restful thoughts. So this person was just able to really get an integrative rest and then wake up and actually pass some clotting, pass, you know, pass material that, may, that continued to wane over a couple of treatments. Um, in a way that also allowed for the emotional process of seeing and feeling more or less the parting take place, which is also very different than a more surgical approach to ridding oneself of the contents. And so um, to me, that was a really beautiful um, way to honor and observe the rising of that Phoenix and also to tend and heal this person's body on multiple levels of embodiment, not just physically, but also spiritually. Thank you so much, Piper. All right, Raquel. Um, thank you, Piper. Um, yeah, I feel similarly with, I think when our team is, is implementing um, steaming or an option as a steaming, my cat's gonna get all up in my business right now. <laughs> Uh, I saw him, I saw him running and I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm in the space where he likes to hang out in the middle of the day with all my stuff. So he's like, what is happening here? Um, <laughs> but as a team, when we're looking at it, because even as a midwife, like, you know, um, I consult, I consult with my whole team, you know, my, in, in, in this, in this work when steaming. And so one thing we're always kind of like, all right, should we suggest steaming? Is that that time for it? You think the mom's ready or, you know, and we're like, it could go either way. You, we know we're like, it's either going to put them to sleep or it's going to get things moving. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> kind of yeah. It's kind of how also like, you know, 
that's also what AccuVibration does, you know? It's like, it's either you're going to put them to sleep and get them to deep rest, or it's going to keep things going. And so I'm thinking specifically we had, um, you know, we were consulting with Piper and Jale, who's on this call, you know, as part of the team, and Colleen, who does our AccuVibrational, we were all at a six-day long birth and this whole process and one of the and and this is also i think for practitioners they're like okay but if i do steam can i not do these other things when steam works holistically to to really like come in with the other things that supporting the other things that you're doing if you're giving herbs if you're giving time to rest if you're you know facilitating those things happening so you know i really think that we were steaming this mama too throughout throughout her process and i think it really allowed for her body to calm, for her body to take that rest, to give her that time that she needed emotionally to match where her body was about to go. Because it's like the first vaginal exam I did before before um, any kind of slowing down of labor, she was at six centimeters. And then we started to see, okay, things are shifting, things are changing. Okay, should we trying the positional things? We're trying the herbal thing. We're trying the active vibrational things. We're trying the guide, the spiritual guidance. Like we're incorporating all of that, and still there's a slowdown in what we should be seeing, right? In the contractions, we need those contractions, and we were still steaming her. Then after that point, we started steaming her, and it was at that point it, the steaming wasn't activating her her surges, her contractions. It just gave her more time to rest. But the second time I checked her, you know, they were looking at progress. This was day five of, or day four of labor, day four or five of labor. And, you know, she, her contractions were like not really occurring at that point. It's like she had gotten to active labor and then everything stopped. And then it like kind of went back to early labor. But when I checked her again at like day five of labor, she was eight centimeters from six with no, with no active contraction pattern. But what we were, what we were doing is we were giving her steam. We were giving her time. We were giving baby time to shift. And, you know, we were supporting her with AccuVibration and of course the nourishment and the food and the sunshine and the, you know, like, so it just like really allowed for us to, all of us to slow down um, and facilitate that like natural physiological birth on her terms and meet her where she was at. Um, and then, you know, and then we've had situations where somebody steamed once and they were like, let's go, you know, <laughs> and, and this is going to happen. Like come out here quick, Raquel, like, I hope I make it, you know? And then I've had scenarios in the postpartum. I think one of the early, I was remembering, I think when, when Chantal was speaking, um, about your personal experience. I think one of the first like postpartum when postpartum clients that I had started steaming um, one day calls me and was like, oh, something like just came out of me. And I was like, okay. And I wasn't, I don't think I was working as a midwife yet. I was a doula, I think at that point, but had already been incorporating steaming or something happened. And, you know, I get to the house to like observe because I was coming over there and she like saved it. Thank gosh, she was like smart and saved it so I could see. And it was her amniotic sac. And I remember it wasn't her midwife because I was like, oh, this is like something that wasn't accounted for during your birth. And nobody would have known that it was still up there unless there was like some type of infection. Thank you. But, but she was steaming and she cleared it. And I was like, well, it's not in you now. So like, and you're not bleeding. So that's great. We don't want it in you, you know? Um, and I think sometimes people get freaked out. Like you said earlier, Kelly, about like, oh, there's clots coming out. What do we do now? And it's like, well, we don't want those sitting inside you. Oh, there's brown blood coming out. Or there's this piece of tissue coming out. I think I had that for myself. I like was doing a, was doing an herbal cleanse Um to like release and clear and just cleanse my organs. Cause I like to do that periodically. And I was steaming and I remember like, I felt something and I like squatted in the shower and I had this whole big tissue come out and people freak out about those things coming out. And I'm just like, no, we want those things to come out. We don't want them in your body. Like that's when you should do a happy dance that those things are coming out. Um, yeah. So, so I have those stories. I think also, you know, conception, of course, I've definitely, um, actually I, I have, um, one of the people who's in dates is, um, um, 
a queer couple that I've been able to support. So I find that steaming, you know, is supporting is supportive gr- throughout fertility. Um, but this is going to be my second queer couple that I've supported preconception through pregnancy. And now I'm, I'm going to be catching their baby and per- supporting them to catch their own baby. Um, so I think also that's a added bonus, especially with queer couples who have a little bit more intentionality. Um, and sometimes for the partners to be involved with the steaming process um, and support that. Um, can be a way of really like, you know, bringing in more of that conception energy in all the ways. So those are some of the stories that I have. <laughs> oh my gosh, so incredible. And you guys, there's more. Like, I mean, we've, we're almost at two hours and, um, oh, sorry, we've been at this for two hours. <laughs> um, but I'm going to, you know, see if we can get a couple more questions, if that's okay with our panelists. Um, Piper, do you need to get going? Okay. Chantal, do you need to get going? Yeah. Okay. I have a little bit more time. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, it, you know, it, any of you guys just excuse yourself when you need to. Um, but that way we just have it on recording. And later, hopefully, I'll chop this up too into pieces so that we can get to some of these. Um, but yes, I've worked with people who, you know, I miscarried six months ago. Yeah. No bleeding for six months. You know, my doctor said it's complete. Maybe they took the, you know, the pills, you know, and everything is supposed to be done. And they start steaming and the pregnancy matter comes up at that point. But guess what? They had missing periods the whole time, right? So the pregnancy matter was still in there. And so I, I really feel like people aren't given proper follow-up or care by their medical providers. And I want birth workers to fill the spot. Like we need to be working more with people during pregnancy loss to make sure that they get that full postpartum uterine cleanse. So they, you know, after pregnancy loss is also a postpartum and postpartum is a uterine cleanse time. And so you have to get that steaming and get everything out because it is so often still in there. I can't believe how much, I wanna look at some statistics out of the clients that I've worked with, how many of them have pregnancy matter that comes out when they start that post miscarriage steaming. And people hit me up all the time. What are the right herbs to use? And I'm always like for post miscarriage, post pregnancy loss, you need to do a consultation with somebody because there are so many possible situations and often it includes now needing to stop. If the pregnancy matter starts coming out, then it's contrary. You, you can steam and then that process starts and you need to stop steam for a while. Then you have to, you can start again. And sometimes then you still see more <laughs> loss come out again afterwards so it's just really incredible um you know and i just really want you know midwives and doulas to fill up this space a little bit more because i don't feel like people are getting proper uh medical care or attention during that postpartum uh especially when it's post-pregnancy loss and then also postpartum as well (laughs) okay so all of it um i've also worked with people who um you know have a missed miscarriage the, 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 you know, pregnancy is no longer vital, but, uh, and they're able to use steaming in order to initiate a natural um, labor and delivery rather than having to do a, a DNC procedure or a DNE procedure, which is dilation, you know, the procedure that they'll have to do to go in. So, you know, there's just a lot of different situations that steaming can be used. And so I hope that this conversation like really, you know, opens people's minds and like gets people sparked to learn about being able to use steaming in these different situations that a lot of times are either, you know, gonna require medical intervention or um, it's kind of just like wait and watch and shrug and there's not much that can be done sometimes in these situations where steaming can be a really effective tool um, to help to, um, you, know, for, you know, the situation. Um, I wanted to say something about that, Kelly, really quick. What you were saying, uh, concerns about people not getting adequate care. And what I see here really is that steaming represents a new standard of care. You know, I think that people who are dealing with Western medicine well, the standard there is to sort of settle maybe for some of those contents left over because the alternative is a very interventive procedure, you know, by our standards at the very least. And steaming really is truly a holistic modality. So we can achieve greater outcome with less potential harm in the intervention. And that allows us to really approximate a new standard of care. We, we deserve for our bodies to be, you know, held in this way and yet we don't really deserve the risk of harm to approximate that. And so this really creates a new pathway. And I think that it 
um, ultimately will revamp the standards that even the Western model has to follow for what we deserve to feel and to experience in our bodies. Yes. Okay, so now let's talk about maternal mortality. Okay, really, you know, I remember my friend the other day, she was like, I was like, no, you don't understand. I was like, we have to steam. It's sa we're saving our lives by knowing how to steam. And she was like, hold on. Like, it was like the records just stopped. She goes, she goes, she goes she run. she's like, you believe steaming saves people's lives? And I was like, yes. I was like, are we missing this? <laughs> I was like, is, have I not been clear enough? <laughs> I believe steaming and knowing how to steam and having that knowledge saves lives, right? So the next question is, and this is the one that I really want to make sure that we get, um, when you look at causes of maternal mortality, um, causes of maternal, maternal mortality include hemorrhaging, so bleeding, we have very heavy bleeding afterwards to the point that the mother doesn't make it right she loses too much blood um eclampsia which is where the blood pressure goes up so high we don't exactly know you know medically what why and what happens but the mom doesn't make it doesn't survive so very high blood pressure sepsis which is a bacterial infection of the womb that happens um, these are the three top um as far as my research tells me causes of maternal mortality. And then there are complications from cesarean delivery, okay? So um, I wanted to ask the birth workers here, do you believe STEAM has the ability to decrease uh, mortality or risk in any of these situations in any way and why? Why so? Um, I'll start with Rick. I can go. <laughs> um, definitely. I think even if you're not trained in how specifically steaming can work, I think the fact that, or with these specific things, right? Like if you're a doula, you might not necessarily be able to gauge like, or check somebody's fresh blood pressure. But if you're a steam practitioner coming into someone's home and setting them up or having a conversation with them, and initially that person is is speaking to you and is like you know what I've been having this persistent headache or I've been seeing like these spots or like in talking to you about things you you have the capacity to already say you know what like you should really go get that checked out or you should really contact your care provider one and I think that's so important because or even as like a family member like really encouraging our family members to be checking in our on our postpartum birthers or the people who have birthed, right, our mamas, because the fact is that in the Western system, you know, you, once you have your baby, that's it. Your next visit is in six weeks, which is absurd. It's just like, it's so absurd. I can't, I can't even like fathom how that, that that's like normal care, you know? Um, so that just somebody having a point of contact in your postpartum to check in, to be like, oh, you know what? Like I am actually like bleeding a lot, you know, and be like, oh, like you should, you know, check that out. <laughs> like, even if you're not the main person's care, care provider. And then as somebody who is a care provider, you know, I can see how, like, if I get somebody steaming, I'm observing that. And I'm, again, like we said, this instance in which, you know, this person had amniotic sac, like still in her womb, like the steaming allowed for that to, to release so that you don't have, um, you know, anything for infection to be um, started upon, right? There's no like bacteria that's going to be feeding on that amniotic sac and create, create a septic situation in there or uterine infection. Um, so absolutely. And then I think like with high blood pressure, part of that is, is the fact that most, I, I find like how, how, what of that, my question is, and another question is like, what of that is related to this idea of like bouncing back as quickly as you can, or people who aren't setting up their postpartum environment as quickly as they can. And I think I remember having this this talk when we were doing the fourth trimester STEAM study with you, Kelly, and, um, and with Kimberly. And Kimberly, I think, was like, well, how much of depression and how much of these things 
are not so much because, you know, the mom isn't, you know, like actually depressed, but they're just like physically feeling bad. And then that's leading to everything else because they don't have the postpartum support. And so when you have that set in self-care for the parent who just went through this incredible initiation, it helps them to downregulate their system. And we can downregulate our system when we can feel like we have control over our health and over our journey and becoming a parent using these practices that's going to control the rest of my systems. That's going to lower my blood pressure. That's going to help me integrate this, this birthing experience, not to mention steaming can support with like any sort of traumatic birth. If you didn't have a home birth or you didn't have the type of birth that you wanted, that helps with that integrative process postpartum, which is also impacting these things. Like, yes, we can talk about these individual sepsis or blood pressure and thing as an individual one concept, but you know me, Kelly, I, can't, I like physically can't talk about it that way. Like, <laughs> it's a multidimensional systematic approach. Like, you know, especially when we're talking about black and brown mothers, black, black and indigenous mothers here in the U.S., you know, that's a whole other panel discussion. But um, so, yeah, I think steaming has key points in which it can absolutely support you know, decreasing the instances of, you know, mortality for our birthing people and increasing a more pleasurable postpartum experience. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, so, you know, again, clearing out that, so steaming helps to get, input in the postpartum, people need to have a uterine cleanse. And so steaming mm-hmm. and bringing out that matter, you know, in bringing that matter out reduces the risk of infection. Totally. In bringing that out, it reduces the risk of hemorrhaging. Hemorrhaging happens most commonly because there's retained matter inside of the womb. Mm -hmm. So yes, usually it's, you know, going to happen within a few hours, but there's times when people, there are times when people hemorrhage just randomly, like six weeks later. Well, that isn't random. There's retained Mm -hmm. Right. So that case of, you know, somebody six months uh, post pregnancy loss who, you know, cleared out their pregnancy matter, literally at any point their, you know, body could have just been like, we need to get this out and flushed it out. Right. And, and that could be a hemorrhage. Right. This we exactly. see it random, but it's not random. The uterus needs to be, you know, clear out all of that postpartum pregnancy matter. And so in doing that, steaming helps to reduce the risk of infection and the risk of, you know, especially even the postpartum, you know, which can happen. Um, And I I just wanted to mention also sutures, like there was a comment I read earlier on the chat from a, from a, I think a young midwife or a new midwife or just a midwife um, (laughs) who was like a little resistant of of using steaming for suture sutures or tears um, because of that that reason or because of hemorrhaging or, you know, resistance in general. Um, and so I find that it's super helpful. Like, I'm so grateful. I feel like steaming that I have that as a tool often helps me to really be like, oh, okay, actually, I don't really need a suture that because I know that they're going to be steaming um, and that's going to help the skin. That's going to help keep the area clean. It's something that they're doing to take care of themselves consistently, you know, and and that's gonna gonna help the tissue to repair itself because of the inherent nature of that space needing warmth, needing to be cleansed, needing to be cleared. It's going. It actually, I feel like generates tissue repair. And if you do have sutures, if you do need sutures, it makes the process of healing from those sutures more easeful. Exactly, I saw that that mark. Uh, <laughs> Piper, you know, especially once you get into the healing phase and they're like, oh, okay, like it's itchy now, or like it's kind of like I feel like this pulling because the skin is regrowing. The steaming makes that all easeful. So I just wanted to make sure I, I touched on sutures um, and tears because because I know that that was mentioned earlier. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Following up, up on those, the four, in the fourth trimester vaginal steam study, which we mentioned earlier, everybody please go to the website fourth trimester vaginal steam study.com to check out this trial study. We only had 12 people, so six in the steam group, six in the non steam group. 
But what we found was, and Raquel was not the midwife in any of these situations, and almost all of them had sutures. I think 10 out of 12 did. So we were able to see the difference in the suture healing between both groups. And the non-steam group continued to have discomfort with their sutures up until six weeks. So that was itchiness, um, burning sensation, um, yellowness and gapping and different things. Whereas our non-steam group, after like the second steam session, had no more discomfort. And all of them started with a lot of discomfort, a lot of discomfort around the sutures. But our non-steam group, the discomfort went away as far as the discomfort urinating, and then it never came back. Whereas our, our non-steam group sadly still had that discomfort at six weeks, you know, so the waddling with the walking or the discomfort with the urinating. So it made actually a huge difference in how quickly the recovery of the sutures happens. And then that's so fascinating that you find that you don't even need to use the sutures, you know, with your clients or in certain situations, if you know that they're gonna be steaming. Um, and then the other one was about high blood pressure. So Raquel took everybody's blood pressure at four days postpartum, at eight days postpartum, and at six weeks postpartum, okay? And then the steam group steamed for five days in a row. So at eight days, they have now done steaming, but everybody started with no steaming. And what we found was that everybody started with their blood pressure high. It's, it's normally pretty high in postpartum, higher than normal, but we had everybody in our group was within normal, but at the higher range. Our non-steam group, their blood pressure was actually higher on day eight postpartum. And our steam group, their blood pressure had universally come down and stayed within a healthy range. So the steam group's blood pressure all came back down to a healthier normal. Whereas our non-steam group, all of their blood pressure was going up and getting towards the line of too high. They didn't, in our group, no, nobody went too high, but it was all going up. It was trending up, whereas our STEAM group was trending down. And I think that was one of the most incredible findings medically for why it would be important to do a follow-up study and learn about STEAMing for blood pressure and for being able to prevent preeclampsia or eclampsia because we saw that the entire STEAM group's blood pressure went down. And sadly, our non-STEAM group, all of their blood pressure was going up. And then at the six-week mark, everybody's blood pressure was, had balanced out. But think about that, you know, that first 10 days postpartum, we saw everybody's blood pressure going up. And part of that might even be, you know, there's different reasons why, right? But, um, and, and, and the study didn't and wasn't able to go into that. But anyways, I just want to share both of those because they do relate to um, you know, possible things that could save people's lives, right? Um, and, and that even though steam hasn't been studied, there's not a lot of studies about it. And this was just a trial study. Trust me, if you pass it on to the doctors and stuff, they're going to say, this wasn't a big enough sample group. But this was a crowdfunded st study by those of us who believe that steaming could save lives and that there should be further studies about this. And so if anything, it was to set up the study so that people can, that the medical, you know, so that it can be replicated or that even just it's enough for maybe those of us who might be able to implement steaming, refer steaming, or be able to, you know, like, um, you know, bring it into our birth, you know, into birth work, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go over to you, Piper, um, with the same question. Uh, do you believe steaming has the ability to decrease mortality? Um, in any of the cases that um, for the leading causes of mater maternal mortality and why? Absolutely, yes. Um, I will say that I think that many of our really abysmal statistics come out of an institutional paradigm. And so at the very forefront, steaming represents a return to a more holistic concept of how to heal and how to tend our, one another within our communities. And so I think that just at the, at, with any, from the intentional perspective, steaming has the power to save lives. As we return to a more holistic based model of care, we are able to observe some of those things proliferating throughout the postpartum experience that we should be paying attention to that are so often neglected for most women. We really don't have postpartum care as a country on, on, a, on a sort of foundational basis. I mean, just the idea that one would have to pack up and take yourself back to the doctor with your newborn postpartum is antithetical to everything that we're trying to achieve in that window. So. We really don't have that to speak of. And that is where our abysmal statistics live. And then I think that we have, this is, we are resurrecting this as part of a more holistic call to 
serving our community the way that we deserve to be received postpartum. So already saving lives on the outset. Then though came this great study, which was wonderful because all of, for all of this sort of intuitive and esoteric reasons that we already know this has life-saving potential, we now also have some physical proof. And I'm totally team Raquel just in general, but specifically to this point right now on this sort of multi-layered interconnected nature of all of these aspects of holistic restoration postpartum. Um, so I think that we, it's great to be able to quantify scientifically what's happening with the blood pressure. But what we know, what we're able to observe and intuit so while being in space with these, pe with these people recovering is that they are able to relax, that we're creating a space to integrate. You can see the shoulders and imagine what's happening with the blood pressure and imagine what's happening with the baby who's being held in the same arms that are connected to those shoulders. So now we, we that maybe sparks us to also look at what's happening with milk flow. You know, I loved everything that, that um, Raquel said about tissue healing, about blood pressure, about shedding lochia. I loved in the study how we actually were able to analyze, thank you to your hard work, the actual quality of the lochia being passed and how at six weeks it was pretty much gone for, for the STEAM group, which I think is really telling about the potential that it affords the uterus to really complete the healing cycle. Um, but I think milk flow was one of my favorites because it's sort of a secondary response, right? We're not necessarily steaming all the way up to the mammary glands that we know of, but we are able to facilitate relaxation, to facilitate a grounding in the birth giving and the lactating person that I think really um, is one of my favorites because it not only indicates their healing, but also the impact that it has on the family as a whole, right? The baby is eating well, the baby is able to relax, which means that partners, siblings might also be getting a little bit more rest. And I love sort of the, the integrative aspect there. So yes, I do believe that it can save lives. I believe that we have proof that it affects us on multiple levels of the postpartum experience. And to my knowledge, all positive, all good things. <laughs> I haven't really seen any drawbacks yet. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, to add the milk flow into the conversation because of what it represents to me as a marker of postpartum healing. Ooh, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to have midwives with all of your authority and all of your experience say that in case anybody missed it. <laughs> you know, I was like, if any people don't understand <laughs> like why we, you know, feel like this is so important, you know. Um, wonderful. Thank you guys so much. So I guess um, I will just um, skip to um, the question, what would you, what would your advice be to other birth workers um, um, about um, how they might integrate steaming into their services or what steps they might, um, they might take to do that? Um, and then we're going to end with um, also what services or products you offer and how people can get in contact with you. Um, so we'll start with Raquel. Okay, um, so I'd say, you know, if incorporating steaming into your practice, one, like, get the knowledge respectfully from wherever you get it, but someone that you can trust. If it's steamy chick, if you have a connection to, you know, your own indigenous practice of steaming in the country or the lineage that you're part of, learn from that learn from those abuelas, learn from those tias, um, or learn from, you know, Kelly has, an, the Institute is an amazing place um, to learn. So receive that. And just like any new skills, just like hone it in, being open and upfront with where you are in your learning process as you start to take clients, making sure that you have um, those teachers or elders that you can you know, call upon if you are facing a situation in which you're not familiar with yet, and start building from that from that ground. Um, you know, don't be scared. <laughs> Take the leap. We need you out here. We need you out here. Um, but learn and be be willing to to learn. I think one of your questions was like the barriers is like. 
don't block off learning, you know, from anybody, maybe from a new practitioner versus an experienced midwife. Like you can learn from everybody. So keeping that open mind as you continue to, to um, be aware and, and learn all the different scenarios as well. Um, and then what, and then what, what was the other part? Did I how answer that? How can people get in contact with you? What services <laughs> do you currently have and how can people Awesome. Okay. Um, I currently um, provide holistic home birth services through Sugar Heal Gang. So you can go to sugarhealgang.com um, and check us out there. I am absolutely booked for the end of till the end of the year and not taking births until about mid March of 2023. So if you're finding out you're pregnant now <laughs> in the LA area, Maybe, maybe we could work together. Um, and then I am taking um, a few holistic uterine health consultations here and there. So you can email me at communitypartera at gmail.com. Um, and that's about it right now. I'm, I'm focused mostly on home birth. Anatomy yeah. class. Oh yeah, and the anatomy class. I have an anatomy class through the Steamy Chick Institute. And I don't know what they need to do before they get to my course, Kelly, so. <laughs> so oh, okay, great, great. great. <laughs> and your anatomy, Raquel is the instructor. <laughs> and she talks about specifically our anatomy, which a lot of people are already gonna know, but how steaming impacts the anatomy, how it impacts the glands, how it impacts yeah. the, um, the external uh, genitalia, the internal genitalia, et cetera. She walks through how steamy it impacts yeah. all of those things. Um, the uterine walls, like it's just so incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a cool course. And then I do a guest, I guest lecture, I think on your, on your steaming specifically for pregnancy and postpartum, no? That's true. Okay, so Raquel is at the Steamy Chick Institute as an instructor in two places. One is her own course, Public Steaming and Your Anatomy, and that course is open to all that you can enter at any time. And then another mm -hmm. course is Vaginal Steaming for Labor Preparation. This course can be taken by birth workers or by birthing clients themselves, pregnant people, um, to be able to learn what they need to steam in labor. And Raquel is a guest speaker there to talk about steaming with GBS, uh, planned cesareans, uh, geriat uh, not geriat uh, diabetes, um, gestational diabetes, and so forth, talking about steaming in these different times, um, and then when, uh, you know, considering these different things. Oh, your audio cut out for a second. Oh, no. I think the labor preparation, can it be purchased? We can't hear you. I think the labor preparation can be purchased at any time because you can purchase it if you're a pregnant couple. So I think it, it doesn't have to be um, taken within the whole full spectrum of the course. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Oh, there you're back. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so anyway, so those great resources are available at steamychick.institute. Okay, so Piper, um, same question to you. What is your advice to other birth workers who are interested in integrating steaming? And then also what services do you have and how can people get in contact with you? Okay, uh, my advice would be jump in, um, experiment with it, use your body as a tool for learning as well. Um, expand your concept of how, of how steaming can impact your health. We are specifically talking about reproductive health right now, but I know Kelly, for instance, steams even with her daughters since they were really young. And there's something really magical too about just normalizing it as a resource that we grab, that we reach for when we are either feeling under the weather or just wanting to invigorate ourselves. So I highly recommend just accessing the tool, get comfortable with it. Um, and then um, to the extent that it's possible in your area, seek to build community around it as well. I love what Raquel said about being open to learn we are in the process of reclaiming this, this knowledge, these technologies, and so we can learn from one another. Sometimes we'll be surprised about what certain applications yield or how people go about their setups. And it's wonderful, even if it's something you don't feel like you want to integrate into your protocol, it can be helpful to learn about it. So, you know, study groups are great. You guys can study and steam. <laughs> um, 
I definitely feel like it's a good idea to not only get really familiar with the tools yourself, but also build community around exploring and learning together. Um, so that would be my advice for not only practitioners taking it on, but also people who are um, interested just in utilizing it as a personal um, tool. I think that that's one of the things that's remarkably generous about Kelly's offerings as well. There's a basic STEAM 101 setup that's even just available on YouTube. This is really about refining expertise, which is when you wanna reach for someone who is trained and skilled in the service and you can always grow your understanding of this technology, but don't be afraid to just dive in there as a novice and reap the benefits. Um, so that would be my advice. And how you can find me, uh, you can find me on Instagram at Grand Multipiper, a little play on words because I got mad kids, y'all. Um, and um, I, you can also, I'm offering online um, educational opportunities via our website, lovemoreparadigm.com. We do various virtual coaching sessions as well as information educational opportunities. Um, and I am down with the Sugar Heel Gang, so you can find me in the gang affiliated section. Also, listening for Love More Paradigm. Um, and I think, I think that's about it. Awesome. And then you still have the podcast, or you have it linked on your website, right? Yes. Any conversation Piper is having, you guys? You know, so she's one of it's the amazing. Stars people that I know she is absolutely a genius like she could probably even take the test as a genius like, <laughs> like she's just one of the smartest people also she has a legal background so she is involved in uh, midwifery rights um, and um, an expert in that area as well okay and my advice is you know like one of the things I really don't want birth workers to separate you know okay you use steaming during this time when you learn how to steam for your period your period is a mini postpartum or your postpartum is an expanded period it's a uterine cleanse so when you learn how to steam if you have a missing period or if you learn how to steam in order to help to reduce the heavy bleeding you're already learning the things that you will then apply um, in postpartum and with your birthing clients it shouldn't be separated out I do believe every birth worker should have a healthy uterus, understand what those signs of a healthy uterus are, what a healthy period is, then you will also be able to apply it to understand when your postpartum client is healed up, when their uterus has, you know, had that full cleanse. And also what's needed, the same foods and teas that you need in postpartum. Right now, there's a wonderful, there's a lot of books now about postpartum care. You can do that every month for yourself and you should. During the first four days of your, of your period of your uterine cleanse, you need the same soups, you need the same teas. Um, if you want to, you can belly bind, you know, in order to give your uterus more support because it's heavier during that time or do it after. You can do that abdominal massage when, um, I'm not an expert, expert, but either after the period is over or if there are issues. All of those are, you know, the period and the postpartum are the same thing. So if anybody is still menstruating, you absolutely should be using the steam for that. And then the same for if somebody is, you know, post uh, menopause. Well, there's a, there's a postpartum menopause. Steam during your menopause to be able to understand during the postpartum menopause when somebody doesn't have their period possibly for a year, how they'll be able to still use the steaming during that time, you know, to help with prolapse or scar tissue or whatever it might be. So I want everybody to know how to use it themselves and be using it in their own care. And that's again, you know, um, from Raquel's story, that's what she was doing. She was using steam herself. And that's why she knew how, like, just intuitively, she knew how it was going to work with her, with her clients when she did become a, um, a midwife. So that's my, that's my advice to everybody learn about, you know, um, and I have all these on my website, go to steamychick.com, you know, the, the, the um, period care guidelines are also the postpartum care guidelines, you know, so you start to apply it with yourself. And I do have, like Piper said, how to set up, you know, how to make a do-it-yourself steam set up. Then again, if you're in a birth and maybe you're not set up, you know, but maybe you can use steaming and you call a steam practitioner and they say, yeah, get the steaming going. Well, you know how to set something up, you know, using the tools at home. So that's my advice to everybody. 
And um, I'm Steamy Chick at steamychick.com or, or steamychick.institute. The two are connected. You can find one from the other. And again, I wanted to thank our sponsor for the talk, um, Build Your Nest, which is a really incredible workbook for postpartum training. If you guys haven't seen it, it's just really incredible. It is for um, a wonderful gift for anybody in your life who is pregnant. Um, and you can also buy it for yourself and you can use it. It's meant to kind of use it during the pregnancy so that you get ready for that postpartum time period, but you can also use it if you are already postpartum and definitely should be recommended for your clients. This is one of Naima who had the leave already. Well, this is one of her favorite tools when she does that postpartum planning with her clients. All right, you guys, thank you so much, you guys, for your time. So generous, Raquel, so generous, Piper. You guys know I love you to death. Um, to everybody who joined, I love you all. I will be sending out this recording. It'll probably be able, I'll probably be able to get it out to you tomorrow. Spread it far and wide. All right. Thank you for taking the time. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Yes, ladies, I appreciate you all. Thank you, you. Thank you ladies. You.